Malibu Rising, by Taylor Jenkins Reid, Part 2, 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. 7 p.m., the clock struck 7 and Kit's best friend, Vanessa de la Cruz, pulled up to Nina's house, the first to arrive. She was immediately approached by one of the team of valets and stepped out of her car, Vanessa was wearing a sky-blue t-shirt, belted at the waist, with white shorts and white pumps. She had teased her hair at the crown and rimmed her eyes in black eyeliner. She had stolen her entire outfit idea from Heather Locklear, who'd been wearing the same thing on the cover of Los Angeles magazine last month, this had seemed like a good idea, until right this very second, when it occurred to Vanessa that Heather Locklear might show up at the party. And then what was she going to do, the valet put his hand out for Vanessa's keys. I mean, I can park it myself, she said. If that's easier, it's my job, he said, gently taking the keys from her, Vanessa watched her AMC Eagle drive away from her. It was still strange to her that the Rivas were rich kids now. She remembered hanging out with Kit at the Rivas house with all the lights turned off to save power. Now, Vanessa wasn't even sure if her shoes were nice enough. Not that any of them, especially Kit, would have ever noticed or cared, Vanessa stepped to the front door and put her hand up to knock. Anxiety was settling in. Every year at this party, she hung back and made jokes in the corner with Kit. But this year, she wanted to get Hud's attention. Maybe this was the night he finally noticed her in that way. She wrapped her knuckles on the door and rang the doorbell, the door opened and there he was. Vanessa was absolutely positive he was only getting better looking with every passing day and it crushed her, oh, hey, Vanessa, Hud said, opening the door wider, a smile on his face. Kit, he called out to the rest of the house. Vanessa's here, Kit came around the corner. Hey, Vanessa's eyes went wide at the sight of Kit's outfit. She'd never seen her friend show so much skin outside of the beach. Wow, Vanessa said. You look great, Hud patted Kit on the back and then walked toward the kitchen. Vanessa watched him go, her pulse slowing down with each step he took away from her, I do? Kit said, looking down at her own torso. Are you sure? Vanessa returned her gaze to Kit and laughed. Yeah, you look hot, okay, good, Kit said. You do, too, thanks, Vanessa said, fluffing her hair as she peeked around for another moment, to see if maybe Hud was coming back, the night was young. The doorbell had started ringing every twenty seconds. Nina could hear Kit greeting people downstairs, she could see the sky darkening through the windows, the stars beginning to brighten against the dusk, please, Nina, Brandon said. I got caught up in something. I got lost, in my own, need to be, I don't know. I had shit I was going through and I handled it in the worst way possible. But, God, I'm so horrified by how I've acted the past few months. I don't even recognize myself in the mirror anymore, honestly. I've never just colossally fucked up like this before. But I'll do anything to make it right. Anything. I love you. Please, Nina, he said as he stood in their bedroom. Give me another chance. You know, I'm not a bad guy. You know that. You know me. You know if I did something this stupid, it's because I was going crazy, I wasn't myself, Brandon got down on his knees and started kissing Nina's knuckles. Her hands were cold and he was warm. I have missed your face, he said, looking up at her, his eyes growing glassy, his voice scratchy. And the smell of your hair. I missed brushing my teeth next to you every morning and night. The way you look the most like yourself in your pajamas next to me at the sink. The way you smile with your whole face sometimes, he said. I cannot live without you, I don't know what you want me to say, Nina said, say you'll give me another chance, Nina found herself looking at the floor and the ceiling. The bedspread and the closet doors. Anywhere but his face. At anything but his eyes, come with me, Brandon said, taking her hand. You deserve to know I'm serious. He began pulling her out of the bedroom into the hallway, Brandon, 
what are you doing? Nina asked, running with him so as not to be dragged, he led her down the stairs, where people were starting to gather in the entryway and living room. Nina caught eyes with Tuesday Hendricks just as she walked in the door. Brandon, Nina whispered. You're embarrassing me, everyone. Brandon called out, his voice booming over the music that had just started playing. I have an announcement to make, Head started to turn in their direction, including Huds. He had been pointing out the nearest bathroom to an Olympic volleyball player. Nina didn't see Jay or Kit but she could feel everyone's eyes on her, if any one of you have read the papers, you might know that I've fucked up recently. That I forgot how lucky I was. That I haven't been such a nice guy, you've been a moron, man, someone called out from the crowd. Everyone laughed and Nina wanted to evaporate into the air, Brandon turned to her. But I'm here to tell you. Nina, in front of everyone here tonight. That I love you. And I need you. That you are the most beautiful, kindest, most amazing woman on the planet. I am here to declare publicly, I am nothing without you, Nina grinned reluctantly, unsure where to look or what to say, he got down on one knee. Nina Riva, will you take me back, somebody whistled. Nina couldn't tell who it was, but she thought it might have been her neighbor Carlos Estevez. The rest of the crowd starting clapping. Someone started chanting, take him back, Nina could feel the room shrinking, as if it could collapse on her, take. Him. Back. Take. Him. Back, suddenly, her voice was so small, she almost wasn't sure it was hers. Okay, Nina said. Nodding, hoping everyone would stop looking. Okay, Brandon swooped her up into his arms and kissed her. Everyone cheered, Kit made her way to the commotion from the kitchen and saw Brandon there, a smile on his face, holding Nina in his arms. He looked so victorious, Kit looked to Jay, who had come in by the stereo, and then to Hud, who was still by the door. It didn't take a genius to figure out what had happened. Kit's expression turned sour, Nina glanced toward Kit at that very moment, saw how it all looked through Kit's eyes. She averted her gaze. 8 p.m., Tuesday Hendrix was wearing baggy black linen pants with black suspenders, a white t-shirt, and a gray bowler hat over her long brown hair. She was fresh-faced and slightly pale. The only makeup she had on was a hint of mascara, she walked into the backyard with her hands in her oversized pockets. Within those pockets, Tuesday had four joints, two blunts, and a spliff, she pulled out the spliff once she got to the open air and then lit it. She breathed in, she held the smoke in her lungs, and then she let it go, she smiled at the people staring at her and then nodded, acknowledging them in the hope they would go back to their conversation, Tuesday, hey. Tuesday turned around to see Rafael Lopez. Her most recent co-star, joining her and handing her a beer. She had not come with Rafael, had not been seeking him out. But she did not mind him. So far, during their current movie shoot, he'd kept his tongue in his mouth when they had make-out scenes and he never made her wait around for him when they were called to set. Plus, if he was standing next to her, perhaps people would be less inclined to interrupt, she was not here to socialize. She was only here to show her face. To let everyone know she wasn't running away after her public scandal, hiding from what she'd done. She wasn't embarrassed. Bridger should be embarrassed. But the man had no shame, I thought you weren't coming, Raphael said, I didn't want to be the woman who couldn't hack showing up. Raphael put his hand out, asking for the spliff. Tuesday handed it over. Tuesday was known for having the best weed. But she was known for this only within Hollywood. To the public at large she was supposed to be innocent and adorable and, ugh, peppy, well, that's what people had thought of her until she met Bridger. Now, she was the girl who left him at the altar. It was exactly a year ago that you two met, right? Raphael asked, Tuesday nodded. This very party. On this very night. One year ago, Raphael took a hit. 
Tuesday watched a pop star and an MTV VJ hang out by the barbecue and pretend they weren't going to screw later. But everyone already knew they were screwing. Tuesday laughed as it occurred to her. This whole town was just people who weren't screwing pretending they were and people who were screwing pretending they weren't, this is basically the anniversary of my very own hell, she added, Raphael frowned at her. The whole world thinks that guy is a saint, the whole world thinks I'm the daughter of a doomed astronaut who builds a time machine in order to visit him before he leaves for the moon. Raphael laughed. That's your fault. Next time don't be so convincing you win an Oscar at 16, 17, Tuesday said, Raphael raised his eyebrow at her. Tuesday watched the party begin to fill up. She smiled at people. She smoked her spliff. She checked her watch. She had told herself she'd stay for an hour. Just so everyone knew she wasn't afraid to see Bridger's face, twenty more minutes. And then she could go, but then she heard a commotion behind her. And she heard Bridger's booming action movie voice. That voice was fake. His real voice was higher pitched and nasal. Tuesday knew this because when he spoke in his sleep, the Rayal voice came out. But even with her, even when it had just been the two of them eating takeout on the couch, he'd always use the fake voice, hey, man, how's it hanging? Bridger said to someone in the doorway, Tuesday could feel him mere feet away now. She turned to Raphael, not wanting to look behind her. He's coming up behind me, isn't he? Her pulse started racing. Here was the problem, what she didn't want everyone to think about her was actually true. She was afraid to see his face. She didn't think she could stand looking at him pretend to be hurt by her. She couldn't bear one more minute of his brilliant poor me routine. He had crafted such a perfect performance as a victim that it unnerved the shit out of her, yes, she'd left him on the day of their wedding. And yes, she could have handled it better. And yes, she had owed him a heartfelt apology, which she had given him, in the bridal suite, in her wedding dress, ten minutes before they were both due to go out there, she had said, I think we are doing this for the wrong reasons, and he'd said, we don't have to be madly in love or anything. But we compliment each other. Everyone loves us. And I do love you. I think you're the greatest actress of our generation. Bridge, Tuesday had said. I want to marry the love of my life. I want to wait for someone that feels like my soulmate, and Bridger had said, come on. You of all people know the difference between real life and movies, Tuesday had let go of his hands and begun to take off her wedding dress. I just can't do this. I'm sorry. I can't marry you. I thought I could. I thought I wanted the magazine cover but, I can't do it, Tuesday, put your dress back on, the show starts in ten minutes, Tuesday had shaken her head. I'm not doing it. And I'm sorry, she got her assistant to signal her parents, who were waiting for her in the first row. The three of them ran to her car and drove away, Bridger went out to the chapel and pretended he expected Tuesday any minute. He started crying at the altar. And then sold the story to now this, that was four months ago. Tuesday had not seen him since, and, just as she heard him coming closer, she decided she did not want to see him tonight either. Raph, God help me, I can't do it, she said and she started running again, this time toward the tennis courts. But when she got to the gate, she noticed she wasn't alone. Raphael had run with her, quick, he said, pulling the gate open. Before the fucker sees us, Tuesday slipped in and Raphael followed her and then he locked the gate behind them. The two of them laughing, suddenly, they were alone, on Brandon Randall's tennis court, beachside in Malibu, a thousand stars in the sky, Tuesday emptied her pockets, showing Raphael the weed she'd brought. He nodded and emptied his own. Quaaludes and LSD, I think we're supposed to just say no, Tuesday said with a smirk, say whatever you want, Raphael said. But then let's get fucked up, suddenly, Tuesday's night didn't seem quite so bad after all, the party was alive, no one was counting but there were 27 people in the formal living room, including HUD. 
There were 20 people milling around the kitchen, including Kit, and 32 people in the backyard, including Jay. There were couples and small groups migrating toward the family room, the dining room, the study, there were seven people in the five bathrooms of the house. Two were peeing, three were snorting lines, two were making out, Jay had been pretending to have a good time by the pool, talking to a few of his surf buddies from up in Ventura County. And then he pretended to have a good time in the living room. Talking to a couple soap actresses, and then he pretended to have a good time absolutely everywhere else at the party, talking to anyone he could find. But, in fact, he was doing two specific things, watching the door and checking his watch. When would Lara arrive, Jay watched yet another group of people that did not contain Lara enter the house. He got frustrated and decided to go upstairs and take a piss, so he did not see Ashley come in the front door. He did not see her look around, clearly with the intent of finding HUD. She watched as people greeted one another with big smiles and outstretched arms. A Greek chorus of, you're here. You came, and, how the hell are ya, Nina noticed a young girl in a purple jersey dress come in. She looked a little lost. Nina wondered who she knew, how she had heard of the party. The girl made her way awkwardly into the living room as a man came up to Brandon and Nina and said, I thought you two were divorced, Nina wondered what it was with some people, that they thought it was appropriate to say every single thought out loud, Brandon said to the man, don't always believe what you hear, and then winked at him, Chris Traverton, Nina's agent, walked in the door and spotted her next to Brandon. He was wearing a double-breasted blue suit with a t-shirt underneath, his jacket sleeves pushed up ever so slightly to reveal his gold Rolex. He smiled at Nina and came right to her. Kissed her on the cheek, are you two back together, he whispered in her ear. Not a bad move, Nina grinned as best she could. Glad you could make it, Chris put his hand on her waist. He leaned to her ear once more and said, I will always show up for you, babe. Always. Did you get my message, Nina blew out a breath. About Playboy, Chris raised an eyebrow. I think it's a good play, Nina smiled politely, keep thinking on it, he said. I have a feeling when you see the money, you're gonna come around. He gave her a sincere wink and a finger gun and then left to get a beer. A cocktail waitress came by with a tray of glasses of white wine. Brandon took one and raised it. Everybody, I'd like to raise a glass to my incredible wife, Nina. She knows how to throw one hell of a party, am I right? The early crowd raised their glasses and cheered, and with that, I say, have fun, get wasted, and don't wreck my stuff. 9 p.m., Ricky Esposito, the guy that ran the photography studio at Pepperdine, was in the kitchen eating cheese and crackers. He had seen Kit walk by four times and, each time, couldn't stop staring at her ABS, he'd had a thing for her for approximately three years now even though he'd never spoken to her and was absolutely positive she had no idea he existed. But when you live in the same town your entire life, you notice people. And everyone always noticed the Rivas, sometimes Ricky would go into Rivas seafood and order fried clams with no bellies, a large coke, and french fries. He'd take a seat out by the parking lot on one of the wooden benches. He'd hope to spot Kit Riva, she was the most appealing person he'd ever seen in his life. He liked that she never had to try to be beautiful. He liked that her body was so solid, so strong. He imagined she was the sort of girl that didn't need a guy to kill a spider and he liked that because, to be honest, Ricky was afraid of spiders, he'd seen her surf at Surfrider Beach every once in a while. He liked to go down to the pier and take a seat on a bench and watch the fishermen. But he could always recognize Kit when she was in the water. She had a bravado that he liked. She was aggressive with the waves, never deferred to other people. Ricky had always imagined marrying a woman like that. His mother was like that, he just needed to find the guts to talk to her, Nina had wandered away from Brandon and was talking to a group of young runway models by the front door. They wouldn't stop asking her questions like who designed her skirt and what eyeliner she was wearing, like, 
what are you doing for your skin? It's fucking, radiant, the tallest, lankiest one said. She was brunette with blue eyes and Nina had gathered, based on how often she kept bringing it up, that she'd walked in McLaren and Westwood's fall show last year. Oh, thank you, Nina said, kindly, and what are you doing for crow's feet, the sweeter looking woman asked, what am I doing for crow's feet? Nina asked, like, to prevent it, oh, you know, just sink when I'm surfing sometimes. And moisturizer, Nina said, la mer, the taller one said, I don't know what you're asking me, Nina said, la mer, said the sweeter looking woman. Creme de la mer. The moisturizer, I just use Noxima, Nina said, the taller woman looked at the sweeter woman and they exchanged glances. Nina became overtaken with the sense, one she had often, that she wasn't a very good model, she pulled herself away from the group, as if someone had called for her. She continued to move through the party. Brandon was holding court in the living room, talking to a crowd of photographers and artists that had gathered around the Liechtenstein hanging above the fireplace, she watched Brandon from a distance, seeing his hands gesticulating wildly, everyone in rapt attention. She decided she needed a glass of wine and so she made her way toward the kitchen, she waved as she walked past the surfers up from Venice who were sitting on her living room sofa drinking beers. She smiled at the three actors trying to pretend they weren't doing coke off of her entry table. She said hello to the four women talking to each other about Dynasty outside her guest bathroom, before Nina could make it to the wine bar set up in the kitchen. A cocktail waitress came by with a tray of Merlot and Nina smiled at her and took one, you have a lovely house, if you don't mind me saying, the waitress said. She was a redhead with green eyes. Nina liked her smile, thank you, Nina told her. My husband picked it out, and then the waitress kept walking and Nina stood right in place, people moving all around her, actresses, models, musicians. Surfers, skaters, volleyball players. Agents and executives. Development assistants. Writers, directors, producers. Those two asshole comedians with that stupid movie everyone loved. Half the cast of Dallas. Three Lakers. It was barely nine o'clock and Nina already felt like everyone in the world was in her house, she sipped the Merlot in her hand slowly, with her eyes closed, breathing it in as much as tasting it. Can I go hide in my bedroom? Suddenly, the DJ put on, 1999, and it broke something open in Nina's chest. Just the sound of Prince's voice, the beat. This song, in this moment, Nina felt like she could leave the world behind, all the people, Brandon, and simply enjoy herself for a second, she walked out onto her lawn to join the partygoers who had started to dance, all right. Nina. Getting down to Boogie, a woman called to her from the mass of bodies moving. Nina looked up and saw Wendy, from the restaurant, you made it, Nina said, smiling. She started bopping her but from side to side, sliding her shoulders. She wasn't much of a dancer but when you love the song, it doesn't matter, it's nice to see you like this, Wendy said. Wendy was a much better dancer than Nina, a much more sexual dancer. Nina marveled at the freedom it took to hump blindly in midair like that, see me like what? Nina called out, over the music, I don't know, you seem lighter, maybe. Carefree, Nina wondered if everyone secretly thought she lived with a stick up her ass. And then, she wondered if maybe she did. It's Prince, Nina said. He does it for me, oh, he does it for everybody, Wendy said, Nina saw Hud by the fire pit and she called to him, tried to wave him over, but he was talking to a woman. Nina looked, closer. Who was her brother flirting with, it was Ashley. Hud was talking to Ashley, he's screwing her, it seemed so obvious. The way they were standing, so close to each other, their lack of reticence about their bodies brushing together. It is discernible, when two people feel complete comfort with each other's skin. It is plain for anyone to see if they are looking, and that's exactly what they had, an electric sort of peace between them, Nina instantly understood that Jay would not take this well. Jay didn't have the benevolent confidence necessary to absorb this blow with ease. 
And Nina felt a sense of doom, as she imagined how the night would play out. The conflict, the mess, this night, Nina could feel in her gut, was not going to end well, Jay was coming down the stairs, when he saw her, there she was. Lara. His Lara, if people could belong to other people, she was standing by the door, next to Chad, wearing a plain white t-shirt tucked into a black miniskirt. She looked about 8 billion feet tall, her legs the full length of her. All Jay could think about was running his hands from her ankles all the way to her ass, how smooth the journey would be, how long it would take him, he pulled it together and walked up to Lara. Affecting nonchalance. You guys made it, he said. What are you having to drink, why don't I head over to the bar? Chad suggested. You two can wait here, Lara asked for a white wine spritzer. Jay took Chad up on the offer to get him another Jack and Coke. And then Chad was gone, Jay looked at Lara, with her gigantic eyes and her thin lips. He felt as if it was just the two of them there together even though there were now close to 200 people in his sister's house. But who cared about the rest? Who cared about the music and the people and the noise? Jay pulled Lara toward him. I'm going to kiss you, he said, all right, she said. So kiss me, then, he leaned over and put his lips to hers. She tasted like spearmint and he tasted like whiskey, Jay grabbed her hand and felt a whoosh through his head. It was the booze. He knew that. But it was also the thrill of letting yourself get swept away. It felt so good to fall, Vanessa was watching Hud through the window as he spoke to a blonde woman out in the yard. Who is Hud talking to, she asked, as casually as possible. I mean, not that it matters, I don't know, Kit said, distracted. This guy Ricky kept looking at her. There were a few guys that had been looking at her all night. Seth had smiled at her again, that guy Chad from the sandcastle was looking at her. Dressed as she was, she could feel a difference in how the room she entered made space for her, she was still trying to figure out how she felt about it. All she knew for sure was that she didn't want to strike up a conversation with Seth or Chad. They seemed too, cool, like they'd expect something of her she wasn't ready to deliver, Vanessa continued to watch Hud out the window as he smiled at the woman he was talking to and snuck a kiss on her neck, right behind her ear. The woman closed her eyes and then touched Hud's face, tenderly, Vanessa's heart sank, do you see this guy over here? Kit said. I think he's friends with my brother. Ricky something, Vanessa looked in the direction Kit was indicating, trying to distract herself, pretending she wasn't thrown. Oh, wow, okay, that guy is checking you out, Vanessa said, don't look right at him. Kit said, hoping Vanessa would quiet down, he's cute, Vanessa said. But from the way that she said it, it was clear she thought it was a qualified sort of cute. Vanessa stole another glance at Hud. Now he and this woman were playing with each other's hands covertly, as if no one could see them, Vanessa closed her eyes, unable to look anymore. What had she honestly thought was going to happen tonight? That Hud was going to fall in love with her? How ridiculous. How completely and utterly ridiculous. She thought she might cry, should I talk to him? Kit asked. Like, if he comes to talk to me, hmm? Vanessa asked, turning back to Kit and trying to catch up. Yeah, totally talk to him. I will not cry over this, Vanessa thought as she kept her tears back. She had to meet someone else. She couldn't sit around pining away for someone who barely noticed her after this many years. She was just learning what type of woman she was but she decided she wanted to be the sort of woman who didn't do that. She turned her full attention to Kit. You should go up to him and start the conversation yourself, Kit sipped her water from a solo cup. She'd never had a drop of alcohol, never smoked pot once. Had no plans to. She pulled the cup away from her mouth and glanced in Ricky's direction. She looked at the way he hovered by the window, pretending to look out of it but, in fact, looking nowhere at all. He looked comfortable being in the middle of a party completely alone, there was something about him, 
he was the one she was going to kiss. 10 p.m., Seth Whittles was standing by the edge of the pool, a bottle of beer in his hand, talking to Hud and Ashley, Seth's jeans were cuffed, his high-top Chuck Taylors were new. His hair was shellacked to his head with a preposterous amount of mousse, when are you and Jay leaving for Hawaii? Seth asked, soon, man, Hud replied. Hoping Jay takes all three events, you guys will probably get another cover, Seth said, we'll see, Hud said. Fingers crossed, you will, Ashley assured him. I know you will, for sure, Seth said. But then it occurred to him it was odd for Ashley to be there at all. Hadn't she and Jay broken up recently, Ashley noticed Seth considering her. Hud noticed it, too. I'm going to go get another beer, Hud said. Anybody want anything, I'll come with you, Ashley said, as if the idea had just come to her, and the two of them walked away, pretending it was a coincidence they were headed in the same direction, Seth, now abandoned, sipped his beer awkwardly and looked for someone else to talk to. He scanned faces for any familiarity, tried to make eye contact with any cute girl he could find, he was, at every party, at every bar, on every beach, living with his heart wide open, looking for the one. His soulmate, his other half. The love of his life, and yet, he could never find her. He always found women who thought he was a nice guy but weren't very interested or women who were interested only until something better came along. But he never could quite find what he was looking for, true love, and, unfortunately, this party was no different, he tried to catch the eye of a girl he recognized from General Hospital, which he secretly watched sometimes when he had an afternoon off. He'd been watching more this summer because Luke was back in Port Charles. He'd thought the actress was gorgeous every time he saw her on the show. And now here she was, smoking a cigarette over by the barbecue, when she glanced at him, he smiled, she took a drag of her cigarette without acknowledging him and then looked back to her friends, if only Seth would make his way out to the driveway. His perfect match was standing right outside, she was on the first step of the front stoop talking to a group of women about whether Lionel Richie was an asshole. She was arguing that he was not, her name was Eliza Nakamura. She was wearing a belted jumpsuit and high heels. Her father was Japanese. Her mother was Swedish. She was a development executive at the Geffen Company. She hated it when people called her a D-girl. Every morning, she woke up and donned a leotard, leggings, and leg warmers, and then made her way to the gym for the 545 aerobics class. Afterward, she showered, ran mousse through her hair, blew it dry, teased her bangs, set it all with hairspray, and then put on her nude hose and one of her power suits. She always doubled up on the shoulder pads, and then she got in her white convertible and hopped into bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic on the 101, at work, she read spec scripts and recommended the good ones to her bosses. She gave writers notes. She took lunches with agents and directors at Spago and the Ivy. She scheduled drinks for herself every weeknight with other executives at places like Yamashiro. She kept a Rolodex of every business card she collected. She wanted to run a studio one day. She knew she would be good at it. She knew she could not let anything derail her, when her boss slipped his hand up the skirt of her suit, she smiled at him and moved away. When a producer chased her around the water cooler, she laughed it off as best she could. On weekends, she'd hang out with her girlfriends and find a bar on the Sunset Strip, the Roxy, the Rainbow, maybe join the party at the Motley House, and make out with whatever eyeliner-clad metal rocker suited her fancy until the early hours of the night. Eliza was not looking for love, necessarily. She had other things on her mind. Both long-term and short-term. She was angling for the head of production opening at work. She was saving up money to buy her own condo in West Hollywood. She had not yet decided if she ever wanted to have children, but she would welcome a certain type of man in particular, a good man, who was a nice guy, who didn't play games and understood that her career was important to her. That she could never quit the business, that she was living her dream.
A man that could give her an orgasm every night and not expect her to make breakfast in the morning. That Eliza Nakamura would have welcomed with open arms, but as Eliza stood in the gravel driveway, now listening to her friend Heather and two other girls ponder whether or not to go talk to some actors inside, she was perfectly happy not finding love at all. She had two scripts back at her apartment that she was supposed to finish by Monday morning. She was looking forward to getting that done tomorrow, and so, she did not go inside. Instead, she hung out in the front yard, talking to her friends, and Seth hung out in the backyard, looking for love. Hud grabbed Ashley's hand. Come here, he said, as he nodded toward the worn path and stairs down the side of the cliff, to the beach. Ashley asked, just for a second, just to talk, Hud told her. With no one else around, he led her over to the steps gently and when they got down to the beach, the two of them sat on the sand. It was cold, almost wet, having released the heat of the sun. Hud put his arm around Ashley and confessed. I fucked up, he said, what do you mean, she asked, Hud shook his head, buried it in his hands. He should have told Jay long ago. He should have confessed it all to him the moment he realized he had feelings for Ashley, when she and Jay were still together, before he ever slept with her, before he fell in love with her, before before before, what sort of man sleeps with his brother's girlfriend, I lied to Jay, Hud said. I made it seem like I wanted to ask you out instead of, well, you know, Ashley braced herself. And what did he say, Hud looked at her. He said he'd rather I didn't, Ashley frowned and turned her head toward the water. She watched it ebb and flow at its own pace. Entirely unhurried, she hadn't wanted to push him on this. She hadn't wanted him to feel like he had to choose. But he might have to. That was becoming clearer to her by the minute, I'm going to talk to him tonight, Hud said. Again. I really am. I'm going to be firm about it. Explain that I'm very serious about you. And he's going to understand, Ashley watched the waves come into the shoreline, watched the moonlight bounce off the water, creating ripples like stripes. She caught her breath, Hud, she said. I'm pregnant. 11 p.m., Bobby Houseman came through the door looking like he'd raided Jordash. He had on black acid-washed jeans, a yellow patterned button-down shirt, and a jean jacket with the collar flipped up, he was not handsome. He was portly and had a slightly cartoonish nose. He had always known if he was going to make it in Hollywood, it was going to be behind the scenes. That was fine with him. He'd been studying films since he was old enough to watch them, hold up in his parents' finished basement outside of Buffalo, and now he was the guy writing some of the biggest hits of the decade so far. Gorgeous, baby. Summer breaked up my Mia. Bobby Houseman was 32 and considered Hollywood's new, it, screenwriter. He'd always imagined that if the day ever came when he was the hottest screenwriter in town, He'd shed his crippling inhibitions and have the time of his life. But in reality, success had not done enough to change him, three blockbuster comedies under his belt and he still felt like the weird wallflower at the movie premiere, the guy not making eye contact with anyone at the Golden Globes, but he always liked the Riva party. He'd been invited to tag along with a producer the summer gorgeous, baby came out. That night back in 80, he'd smoked a joint with Tuesday Hendrix and made her laugh. Every year he came since then, he felt a little bit more like he belonged, that night, when Bobby set foot on the landing of Nina Riva's front steps, he saw that the party was packed. He was, in fact, the first person to comment out loud that things were getting a bit crazier than in years past. His exact word was, whoa, he looked through to the kitchen to see Nina Riva and that tennis guy. She was sipping a glass of wine and talking to a woman next to her, Bobby couldn't help but smile just looking at her. He'd loved her t-shirt ad, with her hair hanging long and her arm up against the doorframe. That see-through shirt and red underwear. Soft to the touch. That was gold. He'd come to Hollywood, in part, to meet a girl like that, so tall and lean and tan. California girls, man. 
Heartbreakers, all of them, Bobby watched Nina touch her husband's arm and then leave the kitchen, out of his sight. He remembered his mission and got to work. He had spent the day procuring an obscene amount of coke and he was going to give it out to everybody. Wallflower no more, as Bobby stood in the foyer, he saw a cocktail waitress, Caroline, walking by with a tray of shrimp, coconut shrimp, she asked when Bobby caught her eye. She moved the tray toward him, grabbing him a napkin, the very fact of her beauty made Bobby nervous. He tried not to think of it. Can I, can I have your tray, he asked. My tray, she said, yes, please. If you don't mind, I can't just give you my tray, because it has shrimp on it, he said, uh. She said. Yeah, Bobby, in a moment of inspiration, took each one of the three remaining shrimp and ate them. And then he said, now it doesn't have shrimp on it, I guess so, Caroline said. She handed it to him and smiled and then started to walk away, wait, Bobby said. I have a gift. For you. If you want. Just hang on. He looked at her for only a split second, but in that split second he felt the spark of something strong enough to give him hope in himself, he wiped the tray down with a napkin. And then took half a brick of cocaine from the inside of his jacket. There was another full brick in his car, oh my god, Caroline said, I know. Bobby poured a little out and started cutting it into as many lines as he could using his Amex gold. And then, he rolled up a hundred. He was embarrassed it was the smallest bill he had, then, he held the tray up like a cater waiter would, and he looked at her. She probably went for the smooth guys with the nice hair. Probably didn't give a second glance to the awkward, chubby ones like him. But somehow, in this moment, he didn't feel foolish for at least trying. And he briefly considered that maybe that had been the problem all along, that he spent so much time feeling foolish instead of just letting go and risking looking like a fool. Care for a line? Bobby said, Caroline was enchanted by the reversal. It was more effective than Bobby ever could have imagined. She would so much rather be the one being served than the one doing the serving, she smiled at him and took the rolled up hundred he'd extended. She leaned in. It felt cold in her nose, burned her sinuses. She lifted her head back up and said, Thank you, Bobby smiled at her. Sure, any time. Then he added, Just to be clear, for you, I would do absolutely anything at absolutely any time, she blushed, what was it about him? He wasn't cute. He didn't seem cool. But he did make her feel admired. It was as if he understood that she was the true star of this party. And she had come out to Los Angeles all the way from Maryland in search of that very thing, to feel like a star, you're a nice guy, Caroline said. Aren't you? Bobby gave her a lopsided smile. Cripplingly so, can I get in on that? asked Kyle Mannheim, who appeared out of nowhere. Caroline had seen him come in with that woman Wendy and the rest of the Rivas seafood staff right at seven. He seemed to be intent on having the greatest night of his life, Bobby held the tray out to him, magnanimously. I brought enough for everybody, he yelled. Caroline tried to slink away, but Bobby mustered up all of his courage and grabbed her hand. Stay, he said. If you want to, I'm working, she said, but there's no more shrimp. Something about the way he said it, the way he was pleading with her to stay by his side, the simplicity of his desire for her company, it was one of the most romantic things Caroline had ever heard. But there's no more shrimp, Caroline will think of that moment later on tonight, when she and Bobby have sex in the coat closet by the front door. No one will know they are there. And Bobby will cradle her hair in his hands to make sure her head doesn't hit the wall behind them. And it will be tender and sweet. And when they are in the throes of passion, cramped up together in that tiny space, barely air between them, Bobby will say, very quietly, I never thought I'd have a chance with a girl like you, and Caroline's heart will flutter, they will not know what the future holds or if their paths will ever cross again. But they will feel that, for one night, at least, someone has seen them as they have always wanted to be seen. And that will be enough, 
one tray of coke being passed around the party quickly became two trays of coke being passed around the party. And, just as swiftly, it was six trays of coke. Waitresses offering blow like it was hors d'oeuvres, to Kit, it felt like one moment she was at a fancy kegger and then she blinked and suddenly everyone around her was high as fuck and believing their own myths about themselves. I am the greatest. I am the funniest. I have it going on, Kit was offered a line of coke by no fewer than three waitresses before she finally said, I'm good. Stop offering me cocaine, thanks, she walked to the patio by the fire pit because she wanted some fresh air and because Ricky was there. She figured she should give him an opportunity, if that was what you could call it. If he was even interested. Which now she was thinking maybe he wasn't, uh, hi, Ricky said as she stood next to him. He had a small dab of feta dip on the very corner of his lip and Kit wondered if she should tell him, hi, she said, yeah, Ricky said. He looked down at his sneakers. Then realized what he was doing and looked back up. I mean, yeah. Totally, hi, Kit smiled. Maybe he was interested, you have a tiny bit of feta, she said, pointing. On your lip, he took a napkin from the table behind them and wiped it off. That makes sense, he said. Because now is the moment that I'm finally talking to my dream girl, so yeah, cheese on my face sounds about right, Kit blushed. Ricky smiled, and Kit started to think this was all a lot easier than she'd made it out to be, Nina was standing next to Brandon in the living room. He was holding tightly onto her hand and whispering into her ear, thank you, he said. For making me the happiest man in the world. It didn't sit right with her, the finality in his tone. I think we still have a lot we have to talk about, she said, of course, Brandon said, pulling her closer to him. I know I have a lot of making up to do. I'm just thankful to be given the chance. I'm grateful you're allowing me to right my wrongs. Nina smiled, uncertain what else to say. She wasn't quite sure how he ever possibly could right his wrongs. But she supposed she had told him she would let him try, so, Bran, tell us, said a lanky guy in a striped rugby shirt and salmon-colored chinos. He was standing next to a guy in Bermuda shorts and buckskin shoes. Every year more and more preppies were showing up at her parties, and if she was honest with herself, she knew it was Brandon's influence. Think you'll grab another slam title next month? The front door opened and Nina looked up to find that the person coming across the threshold was a great excuse to leave Brandon's side. Her closest friend, fashion model, Tareen Montefiore. Eyes turned to look at the singularly gorgeous woman that had just walked in. Most people recognized her from her multiple covers of Vogue and Elle, her contract with Revlon. But even those who could not place her knew she had to be one of the most beautiful women in the world. With dark hair, warm brown eyes, and cheekbones that looked like they could cut you, Tareen seemed carved of marble, with too many casual perfections to be human, her hair hung long and straight, her eyes were shadowed in silver and black, her lips were covered in a high clear gloss. She was wearing a white microdress and a black leather motorcycle jacket. She had on black pumps that would have broken anyone else's ankles if they took a single step but she glided into the room effortlessly. And then there was the accent. Tareen had been born in Israel to Spanish Jewish parents and then moved to Paris when she was 11, Stockholm at 16, and to New York City when she turned 18. She had an accent entirely her own, she and Nina had met on a Sports Illustrated swimsuit shoot in Panama City a couple years ago. They posed together in yellow bikinis sitting on opposite sides of a dinghy. The photo became so well known, two guys had parroted it on SNL, Nina had liked Tareen instantly. Tareen would tell Nina which photographers were handsy and which agents tried to screw their clients. She would also tell Nina not to smile too wide or she'd show her lower, crooked teeth. Tareen was kind, even when being kind meant not being very nice. Nina was very happy to see Tareen standing in front of her. And she was surprised when the door opened again and behind Tareen came Greg Robinson. She had never met Greg personally. 
but she knew who he was. He'd worked with her father. He was the producer behind the biggest hits of the past two decades. Sam, Samantha. Mimi Red. The Grand Band. Greg was the one creating these people, creating their music. He'd even had a few hits of his own back in the late 60s, Greg put his hand on Tareen's shoulder comfortably, and that is when Nina realized her 27-year-old friend was dating a man who was at least 50, Nina made her way over and Tareen smiled at her. Nina leaned in and gave her friend a tight hug. I'm so glad you made it, she said, yes, well, I know it is the party of the century, Tareen said, Greg, hi, Nina said, shaking his hand. Welcome, it's a pleasure, Greg said. I'm fond of your father. Some of my first big jobs were on his records. Great guy, Nina flashed her perfected smile. Brandon spotted them all and came to join the conversation, Hi, Tareen, he said, raising his glass to her, Brandon, Tareen said, her face blank. A surprise, Brandon smiled and introduced himself to Greg. Greg shook Brandon's hand and then looked around the living room, clocked the DJ, any chance I can get behind that deck? Greg asked, Nina turned in the direction Greg was looking, at first not sure what he meant, Greg cannot stand it when another soul is in charge of what he is listening to, Tareen said, holding Greg's hand, Brandon looked at their hands. Intertwined together, for a moment too long, and something about the way he did it gave Nina the impression that he was less surprised about their age difference, and more surprised that Tareen was dating a black man, are you kidding? Brandon said, recovering quickly. We would love to have you in charge of the ones and twos, Nina wasn't sure what she cringed at more. Brandon trying to sound like Greg Robinson or Brandon saying, we, so casually, I'll take you over, Brandon said. I don't want to upset your guy. I'm sure he's great, Greg said, no, Brandon said, waving Greg off. He gets paid either way. He'll understand the Greg Robinson is here, Greg laughed and then the two of them walked in the direction of the DJ, with the intention of breaking his heart, I need your best red wine, my love, Tareen said, the moment they were out of earshot. Not the low shelf stuff you give to everyone. The stuff you reserve for people like me, please. It has been that kind of day, Nina laughed. Tareen could be completely and utterly obnoxious. But Nina simply didn't mind. She admired the way Tareen never pretended to be anything she wasn't, the way she was so confident in exactly who she had chosen to be. As if there were never any other option, I do not mean to be rude, Tareen said. Obviously. But there are men smoking cigarettes in saggy pants outside. I cannot drink the same wine as them, Nina laughed. They're drinking cores from a keg. Tareen frowned and it was clear to Nina that she had never heard of Coors, did not have a context for it other than to know it was beneath her. I suspect you are proving my point, Tareen said, Nina took her friend by the hand and brought her around the foyer to a small hidden door under the stairs. She hit four digits on the keypad and showed Tareen the wine cellar, choose whatever you want, Nina said and then she slipped her hand out of Tareen's. Just close it up after you take your bottle. Do not think you are leaving me here, Tareen said, the music changed abruptly, from new wave to top 40. Nina watched as a rush of young women came running through the kitchen on their way to the living room. Tareen and Nina overheard one of them say, no way is Greg Robinson here. No way. The whole party got louder, everything elevated, the melody, the beat, the screams of excitement. I was going to see how things were faring outside, Nina said as she pointed toward the lawn, Tareen shook her head, raising her voice above the din herself. No, you are not. You are going to stand here with me while I choose my bottle and then we are going to go somewhere and you are going to tell me why Brandon is here. I thought we were done with that snake, Nina felt a bit nauseated at the thought of having to explain. She wanted to make a joke. But Tareen was not someone you could brush off. Nina wondered, for a moment, how one became like that. What did it take? To say exactly what you meant? 
To feel comfortable in the middle of causing discomfort? To not feel, so intrinsically as to be as vital to yourself as your blood, that it was your responsibility to make things smooth and pleasant for everyone? Tareen looked at Nina more pointedly, waiting for Nina to explain herself. Nina shrugged and said, I love him. Tareen turned and looked at her, furrowing her eyebrows, not buying it. Nina rolled her eyes and tried a different answer, one closer to the truth. It's just easier this way, she said, easier? Tareen asked, yeah, just, like, not as complicated and, just easier. Tareen frowned and then pulled a bottle of Opus 1. I am taking this, Tareen said. All right, Nina nodded. Tareen shut the door and pulled Nina through the crowd of people to the kitchen counter. She ruffled through Nina's knife drawer and cooking utensils until Nina found a wine opener. A cocktail waitress came by offering wine on one tray and lines of coke on the other and Tareen waved her off. I have what I need, thank you. Nina stared at the tray of coke as the cocktail waitress snaked her way farther through the kitchen. She wondered when, exactly, that had happened. People couldn't just do coke off the coffee tables anymore, Tareen turned the corkscrew and then pulled the cork out. The people around them turned at the sound. Some of them watched for a moment too long, these two beautiful women standing next to each other. Both tall and tan and lean and sparkling. Then they all went on with the rest of their conversations, Nina saw the girl in the purple dress again, standing alone near the chips. She'd noticed her earlier, coming in the door. Now, the girl met her eye, somewhat timidly. Nina got the distinct impression the girl wanted her attention, would have loved the opportunity to talk to her. Increasingly, Nina was feeling like the party attracted people who wanted her to provide them a good story to tell. They wanted to be able to say they met the girl from the poster or the girl from the t-shirt ad or Mick Riva's daughter or Jay Riva's sister or Brandon Randall's wife or whatever other way they wanted to define her. Do you ever wish you could be invisible for five minutes? Nina asked Tareen. Tareen looked at her, considered her. No, she said. That sounds like a nightmare. Tareen poured herself a glass and suddenly, Kyle Mannheim pulled up between the two of them, hey, Nina, he yelled over the music. Great party, thanks, Nina said, can I get in on that? Kyle called to Tareen as he held out his empty cup, Tareen looked at Kyle, sizing him up, and then said, decisively, not going to happen, Kyle walked away and Tareen took a sip of her wine. She closed her eyes as she tasted it, as if everything else could wait. When she opened her eyes back up, she said to Nina, Today has not been easy. I found wrinkles between my breasts. Nina laughed. What are you even talking about? Tareen put her wine glass on the counter and surreptitiously pulled the top of her dress down. Nina had to admit she could see the faintest set of lines along her friend's cleavage, I am getting old. The offers are going to start to dry up, Tareen said, Oh, stop it, Nina said. You still have plenty of time. Three more years, tops, Tareen said, and Nina knew this was probably right. In the world they lived in, they had to make hay while the sun shined because once the sun set, it got very cold and dark indeed, but part of Nina ached for that time, the time when people stopped looking, stopped caring. Part of her wished she could take her beauty and hand it over to someone else, someone who wanted it, Three years is still a long time, Nina said, I am not sure I agree, Tareen said, so is that why you're with Greg? Nina asked, quietly. Some security, Tareen shook her head. I am with Greg because I find his gray hair sexy and I like talking to a man that has been alive long enough to have had interesting experiences. I do not need anyone's money. I have a lot of it and I use what I have to make more of it, Nina smiled. I shouldn't have expected anything less, no, you should not have, Tareen said, it surprised Nina that Tareen had been accumulating money in such a purposeful way. It had never really occurred to Nina to try to secure outlandish wealth for her future. She had only ever wanted money because it solved problems. Anything more than that seemed superfluous, like extra air, 
I cannot believe you took him back, Tareen said, grabbing her glass again and folding her arms. She looked right at Nina, square in the eye. You know what? I am going to do you a favor and tell you what your problem is, oh, I have a lot of problems. Nina said, Tareen shook her head. No, you do not, actually. That is what is so remarkable. You have just one very big one. Most people, all of these people here, Tareen said, pointing in the general direction of everyone surrounding them, all of us have thousands of little flaws. I have a lot of them. For instance, I am very judgmental, but I am also very absent-minded, and that is just the start of it, Nina did think of Tareen as judgmental, but she didn't see it as a problem. And she would never have thought of Tareen as absent-minded. But you, Tareen said. With you, it is just the one problem. And it affects everything you do and, Nina, I am sorry to say this, but I hate it about you, all right, Nina said. Go on and tell me, Tareen sipped her wine and then said, I suspect you have not lived a single day for yourself, Ricky Esposito knew only two ways to woo a woman. One was reciting Shakespearean sonnets. And the other was doing a magic trick, Ricky chose magic. And so he was rummaging through the kitchen drawers of Nina's home, looking for a deck of cards, while Kit drank her club soda out on the patio alone, granting half-smiles to the half-strangers that littered her sister's lawn. Kit spotted Vanessa talking to Seth over by the grill, Vanessa had seemed so sad earlier. But then Vanessa had told Kit she was determined to meet someone new, and Kit had decided not to push her on what new meant. If she was getting over HUD, great. Now Vanessa was laughing as if Seth Whittles was the funniest guy in the world. She had her hands in her hair, playing with a section of it by her face. Kit watched as Vanessa put her hand on Seth's shoulder and pushed him ever so slightly, teasing him. For a moment, Kit felt a flash of dread. Was she going to have to act like Ricky was funny? Ugh, she thought of Nina gazing up at Brandon like she was proud to stand next to him. She thought of the way her mother used to talk about her father like he was the second coming of Christ. She couldn't be like that, she turned away just as Seth kissed Vanessa and suddenly Ricky appeared in front of her, flushed, with a deck of cards in his hand, catching his breath, pick a card, any card, he said, and as he said it, Kit regretted every single choice she'd made that had brought her to this moment. This is what she had always wanted to avoid, being forced to pretend men were interesting. Kit looked at Ricky and then at the cards fanned out perfectly in front of him. She grabbed one from the middle. Do I look at it? She asked, with a sigh, I know it seems lame, but humor me. I've practiced this a lot and I might just blow your mind, Kit smiled and, despite herself, began to root for him. She looked at the card. The Eight of Diamonds. Okay, she said. I've got it, Ricky offered the deck back to her, this time cut in two. All right, put it back, he said, gesturing to the lower half. Kit did as she was told and Ricky shuffled. Her card was now lost, one among many, Ricky palmed the cards in his hands, and as he did it, Kit found herself distracted by the commotion around the pool. She couldn't see what was happening but it seemed like things were getting loud. Ricky held up a card from the top of the deck with flair. Is this your card? he asked. A three of clubs, Kit shook her head. She had wanted him to get it right she realized. She had wanted him to dazzle her. No, sorry, Ricky smiled. Oh, okay. He flicked the deck like his finger was a magic wand and picked up the card again. It was now an eight of diamonds, the tiniest charge ran through Kit. Wow, she said, genuinely impressed. She did not know how he had changed the three of clubs into the eight of diamonds. She knew it must be something simple, but she couldn't begin to suspect what it was, do you want to know how I did it? Ricky asked, pleased to have pleased her, aren't you supposed to never reveal it? Kit asked. Ricky shrugged and so Kit stepped in closer, shortening the distance between them, all right, she said. 
show me, Ricky pulled the deck out again and did it in slow motion. When he revealed the true sleight of hand necessary for the illusion, picking up two cards and making it look as if they were only one, Kit was close enough to notice that he smelled like fresh laundry, that's all there is to it, Ricky said, showing her the way he held the cards. It's called a double lift, that's rad, Kit said. He smelled really good. How did he do that, I can show you how to do it, Ricky said. If you want, nah, she said. But do it again. I want to see if I can spot when you do it, she did not actually care. She just wanted to smell the sleeve of his t-shirt. She just wanted to feel the thrill of his interest, it was then that Ricky took a step closer, and with haste and trepidation, kissed her. His lips were soft and gentle but as his body moved against hers, Kit knew in her gut this was all wrong. This wasn't it. Whatever it was supposed to be, because she liked Ricky, she did. He was sweet and sort of embarrassing in a lovely way. But the second his lips hit hers. She knew that she had never truly wanted to kiss him, she was pretty sure she did not want to kiss any guy at all, suddenly. Kit felt desperate to quiet the voice that she now realized had been calling to her for years. And so, she kissed Ricky Esposito harder. She put her arms around him and pushed her chest against his, as if, if she really tried, she could deny everything she knew was true, Tareen had gone in search of a good joint so Nina hung out in the kitchen, talking to a couple of movie producers. She was almost positive that both of them were named Craig. Your 1980 calendar is hands down the greatest calendar of all time, first Craig said. He was stockier, meatier, but strong. He looked like he probably worked out two hours a day. Nina smiled, acting flattered, pretending she cared, I mean, July? Second, Craig said. He was blonde with a square jaw, even his posture was arrogant. The one in the white bikini. He whistled. I still think about it, first Craig said, that's nice, Nina said dryly. And then she quickly added a, what, in the opposite direction, as if she heard someone calling to her from the stairs. I'll be right there. And then, she smiled and left them in the kitchen. When she got to the stairs, she saw Brandon out by the front door talking to some Olympic runner Nina knew she was supposed to remember. But instead of going to join the conversation, she turned and went up the steps, looking for a moment of peace. That was all right, wasn't it, she walked past a couple making out against the wall of her hallway. She smiled at the two former child stars sitting on the floor rolling a joint, when she got to her bedroom, she shut the door behind her. She went into the master bathroom and stood at her mirror. She reapplied her lipstick and smacked her lips, was Tareen right, how do you live a day for yourself? Nina didn't know. She imagined what a day of her life would look like if she were living only for herself. Maybe going somewhere on her own. Like the coast of Portugal. Just her and the sunshine, a good book, and her Ben Ipa swallowtail surfboard. Small pleasures. She'd spend her time surfing and then eating good bread. And cheese. But really, Nina just wanted peace and quiet so long-lasting and secure that it might even settle into her bones. Excuse me, Nina turned toward her bedroom door, the one that had been closed just a moment before. Now it was open and there was a young woman standing in the hallway, one hand on the doorknob, the girl in the purple jersey dress, Nina, the girl said, yes, the girl was short, and young, maybe seventeen or eighteen. Her hair was dark blonde, her skin was alabaster and perfectly clear. As if she had never spent a day in the sun, I was wondering if I could. The girl's fingers were shaking. And with each word the girl said, her voice became more uneven. I was wondering if I could talk to you. Just for a moment, um, Nina said. Sure, come on in. What can I do for you? As Nina was looking at the girl standing in front of her, the answer was already beginning to come to her. But she couldn't quite grasp it yet, I wanted to, well, the girl said, wringing her hands and then catching herself doing it. My name is Casey Greens, she said, hi, Casey. 
Nina could hear the slight edge in her own voice. She tried to hide her wariness better. You seem like you want to say something, and that's when Nina saw it. Or, maybe more accurately, realized what she had already seen. Casey's lips, a big lower lip, full like an overstuffed cushion, Casey Green's did not look anything like Nina or Jay or Hud or Kit or Mick. Except for that lip, and Nina's heart sank, Casey spoke up. I think Mick Riva might be my father. Casey Green's didn't belong here. In Malibu, of all places. With the rich people and their perfect bodies. She knew that. She could feel it with every step she took on the thick, expensive carpet. She'd never stood on anything that plush, that soft before. She had grown up in a world of worn-out shag carpeting, shag carpeting and wood paneling and screen doors that still let in bugs. She came from a home of warmth even when it was cold, a home of beauty even though it was categorically hideous. Her town was called Rancho Cucamonga. Her parents were Bill and Helen. Her home was a California ranch. It had a birdhouse built on the top of it, she was an only child, good at getting straight A's, the kind of kid who liked spending Saturday night with her parents. Her mom made the very best tuna casserole in the world. And Casey would ask for it every year on her birthday. She understood that she had lived a pretty sheltered life, right up until she lost both of her parents in one fell swoop, Casey still heard the term in her head, woke up with it in her mind and fell asleep with it in her ears, even weeks after her parents' car accident, died on impact, her parents, her deceased parents, hadn't prepared her for a life without them. They hadn't prepared her for loneliness, for true adulthood, for the shocking revelations that would now have to come to light, Casey had always known she was adopted, that her biological mother had died during childbirth. But she didn't know much more. And that was okay with her. She had parents. Until she didn't, days after the funeral, she was packing up her parents' things, trying to determine what to do with the life they all had shared. What was she supposed to do with her father's clothes? Where was she supposed to put her mother's antiperspirant? She was packing and unpacking, repacking. She was caught in a whirl of thoughts. The statements, leave everything exactly where it is, and, get all of it out of my sight, fought for dominance in her heart and head. She sat down on the floor and closed her eyes. And she got the wild idea to do something that had never occurred to her, to look for her birth certificate, it took an hour and a half to find. It was in a locked box underneath a few other papers, Casey grabbed it and looked at it. Casey Miranda Ridgemore was her given name. Her birth mother had been named Monica Ridgemore. The space for the father's name was blank, the next thing Casey found was a photo of a young woman. Blonde, gorgeous. Big eyes, high cheekbones, an all-American kind of smile, when Casey turned the photo over to see what was on the back, in handwriting she didn't recognize, it said, Monica Ridgemore. Died August 1, 1965. Below the date was another note. Claims the baby is result of a one-night stand with Mick Riva, Mick Riva? Casey thought she must be reading it wrong. She must be misunderstanding. Mick Riva, she pulled out the R volume of her mother's encyclopedia set just to make sure she wasn't insane. Riva, Mick, singer, songwriter, born 1933. Considered one of the greatest American recording artists of all time, Mick Riva, any Michael Dominic Riva, came to fame in the late 1950s and swept the charts with his romantic ballads and smooth vocals. His chart-topping success, classic good looks, and impeccable style has made him one of the most notable icons of the 20th century, Casey closed the book, it took her a couple of weeks to come to terms with the idea. In moments when she felt she could get out of bed, she stared at her face in the mirror, compared it to the album cover she found in her father's pile of records. Sometimes she thought she saw something, other times she thought she was crazy, even if there was legitimacy to the idea. What was she supposed to do? Track down one of the most famous singers in the world and confront him, but then, three weeks ago, 
she saw someone named Nina Riva on the cover of Now This. It said she was the daughter of Mick Riva and lived in Malibu, California. And Casey thought, Malibu isn't very far at all, before her parents died, Casey had been accepted at UC Irvine to start in the fall. After her parents died, she knew going away to college was the only thing she had left in the world. College would have to be where she began again, but after she packed up her truck and headed for freshman orientation, Casey drove past the entrance for the 15 South that would take her to Irvine. She found herself getting on the 10 West. Headed for Malibu, what am I doing? She thought. Do I think I'm just going to somehow find this Nina Riva person, still? She kept driving, when she hit the coastline, she drove up and down PCH, trying to find the grocery store in the photo. The one Nina had been walking out of, in the article it had said that Nina and her three siblings had lost their mother almost ten years before. And when she looked at the photo of Nina again, she detected sadness in her eyes, perhaps a world weariness. Casey figured she was probably imagining it. But still, she reasoned, Nina must know how it felt to lose a parent, there aren't many grocery stores in Malibu. It wasn't long before Casey found the right one. She walked in and stood in line with nothing in her hands. When she got to the cashier, she said, sorry to bother you. Do you know Nina Riva? The cashier shook her head. I mean, I've seen her but I don't know her. Casey tried this with every cashier she saw, as well as the butcher, the entire bakery department, and the shift manager. Until finally someone said, why don't you just go to Riva's Seafood, Casey drove out to the restaurant she just learned about, parked her car, and walked in. She stared at every single customer. Every single server. She went up to the counter. Is Nina here? A blonde woman with a name tag that said Wendy looked up at her and shook her head. No, sorry, hun, dejected, Casey walked out to her truck. She was crazy. Driving to Malibu? Trying to track down a famous model with a famous father? That's what stalkers do, Casey backed out of the parking lot and turned south. She stopped at a gas station to fill her tank trying to decide if she was filling it up to go home or to go to her first day of school in Irvine or to drive off a cliff, she got out of the car and asked the cashier to put $20 on pump number two. She went back to her car and put the nozzle in her gas tank and pressed the trigger on the hose. Which is when Casey overheard two men at the pump next to her, are you going to the Riva party tomorrow night, the tall one asked, no doubt, man, let me get that address from you the second man laughed as he pulled the nozzle out of his gas tank. Craig, you know if you don't know the address you aren't invited, so give me the address, what's it to you? Everyone in Malibu is going to be there and you're gonna be sitting on your ass alone, cause you don't know where Nina lives, dude, give me the address. You owe me after I hooked that shit up for you with the girl from Gladstones, after that, the second man spouted the address like money coming out of an ATM. 28150 Cliffside Drive, there it was. Casey had come all that way and fate had provided. She had slept in her truck that night, parked on the side of the road on the coastline. And then this morning, she had gone through all of her packed clothes and pulled out the only decently cool dress she owned, and here she was, who did you say your mother was? Nina asked, as Nina had listened to Casey's story. Her mouth had gone dry. She started doing calculations in her head based on how old this girl was. She'd have been born after Mick left the final time. And Nina had no idea what messes her father had gotten into since then. So she was about as much of an expert about this as Casey herself, I actually don't know that much about her, Casey said. All I know is that her name was Monica Ridgemore. She died giving birth to me, I think. Casey pulled her purse open and took out the photo, handing it to Nina, she was really young when she had me, Casey said. I mean, she was as old as I am now, Nina wasn't sure what good the photo would do her, why she'd even asked about Casey's mother. But still, she took it in hand and studied it. Monica, at least in the photo, 
was young and blonde and pretty in a very conventional way. When Nina looked at the photo, she saw where Casey's big eyes came from, but there was also so much about Casey that Nina couldn't place. She didn't have either Monica's or mixed cheekbones or either of their coloring, neither of their noses. In fact, Casey didn't look like Mick Riva at all except for her lower lip. She turned the photo and read the back. Claims the baby is result of one night stand with Mick Riva. There had to be a lot of women who fantasized about an affair with Mick Riva, right? Nina hoped, for Casey's sake, that the claim was wrong. She hoped there was a better man out there, waiting for Casey to find him and tell him she was his daughter. She handed the photo back and sighed with her whole body, resigning herself to the futility of this exercise. There was no way to know, Nina gestured for Casey to have a seat in one of the leather chairs by the window, and Casey sat down with such deference and appreciation that Nina realized she should have offered her a seat quite a while ago, Nina took a seat next to her and wasn't sure what to say next. What did Casey want, quite a night, Nina said, yeah, I guess so, Casey responded, the two were quiet for some time, both of them wondering what on earth they could possibly say next. In the silence, they simply watched the party unfolding on the lawn below them, chaos was simmering. The music was deafening and people were in various states of undress. There must have been a hundred people in the pool. Someone had rigged the jets in the jacuzzi to ricochet off of serving plates and spray people on the lawn, there was a young woman sitting by the grill, reading a book. Casey looked, closer. Is that the girl from Flashdance, she asked, Nina nodded. Jennifer Beals, yeah. Love her, Casey's eyes went wide for a moment. What a world, Nina spotted Jay talking to a very tall blonde woman. He seemed to be showing her the ocean from the cliffside, see that guy? Nina said. The tall one talking to the blonde woman? There on the side, Casey leaned in. Yeah, that's my brother Jay, oh, okay, Casey said, nodding, so he might be, might be my brother, too. Nina looked at Casey, trying to process how bizarre this conversation was. Yeah, she said. Might be your brother, too, Nina looked for Kit and spotted her talking to someone on the far corner of the patio. Nina put her finger up to the window. The girl in the crop top and Daisy Dukes talking to that skinny guy, potentially my sister? Casey asked, Nina nodded. And then, she started looking for HUD. She scanned the area, cataloged every person she could see. She could not find his broad shoulders and barrel chest anywhere. I'm trying to find my brother HUD, but, doesn't look like he's down there. As she kept looking, Nina thought of what would have happened if Hud's biological mother had never left him in June's arms. Would he have shown up? At some point? Wanting to meet them? Wanting to know about his father, Nina imagined feeling like a stranger to him, imagined him feeling like a stranger to her. What a loss that would have been, to have gone her whole life not knowing this person who felt like he owned one third of her heart. To not have been there during HUD's obsession with Frisbee, or to see how excited he was when he got his first camera, to not know HUD's gentleness, to not know that HUD can't eat too much vinegar or he starts to sweat. He was hers, Nina looked at Casey. Did some of the same blood run through their veins? Nina didn't know. She was not sure if she thought Casey might really be her sister or not. But if Casey was, Nina was already sad for what they had lost. Casey continued to look out the window, stealing glances at Nina. She was trying to gauge just what, exactly, was going on in Nina's mind. She was reminded that she did not know the woman whose bedroom she was currently sitting in. She had no basis for trying to guess at her inner thoughts, sorry for crashing your party, Casey said, Nina shook her head. Everyone's invited. Sounds like you might even belong here, Casey gave a downcast smile. And Nina did, too. And their smiles were completely different, nothing alike, my mother died, too, Nina said. She was the only parent I had. We had. So, I, I'm sorry. No one should have to go through that. 
What you went through, Casey looked at Nina and felt like she wanted to melt into her arms. Maybe this had been all she wanted. Just someone who understood, someone to tell her she didn't have to pretend to be okay, Nina reached out and took Casey's hand for just a moment. She squeezed it and then let it go, and then the two of them, somewhere between strangers and kin, watched the party in silence from the second floor window. Midnight, Mick Riva was standing in front of the mirror in his bedroom, straightening his tie, he looked good for fifty and he knew it. His once jet black hair was now more salt than pepper. His once smooth face now creased at his forehead, eyes, and mouth. His good looks had not faded but instead had grown roots, he was wearing a black suit and thin black tie, the look he had been known for for decades, the look he had perfected, beside him, on his vanity table, was the demo of three songs he'd recorded for his new album. All of them had been softly rejected by his record company. They'd sent a mostly sycophantic note that included the very unsycophantic kicker, we worry these tracks are too classic Mick Riva. But what excites us is looking forward, who is the Mick Riva of the 1980s, just looking at the thing made him mad. How had it come to pass that someone like him, a luminary, was expected to listen to the musings of a 20-something AR guy with pierced ears and a preoccupation with synthesizers, Angie would have fought back and made them release the tracks, and any others he decided to record. But unfortunately, they were no longer together, Angie, as both his manager and his sixth wife, had always understood that Mick just needed to be allowed to do his thing and the world would come running. It had been working for the past 30 years. Angie always got that, he wished he could go back in time and warn himself not to cheat on her. Or not to let her find out, or maybe, perhaps, not to fall for her back in 1978, when she was just the young new redhead in his manager's office. Because now he was not quite sure who was supposed to fight his battles for him, when you fall in love with your manager's assistant, fire your manager, promote his gorgeous assistant, marry her, and then divorce her, you're left with no wife or manager, which is how Mick got to be 50 years old and living alone with his butler, Sullivan. Just him and Sully in this white brick and ivy mansion that Angie had picked out and decorated. She had loved the oversized eat-in kitchen. Now Mick refused to let Sully make him dinner because he didn't want to feel pathetic sitting at the table all by himself. It was a table for six, the other day he'd had the thought that it would be nice to have a big family, have all of his kids come over for Sunday dinner. They could fill the place up, make it feel alive in there again. He thought about calling them. Nina, Jay, Hud, and Catherine, they were young adults now. He could understand them, maybe offer them advice, or be useful to them all. Maybe they would like that, too, he had been considering picking up the phone. But then he had received a handwritten letter in the mail, despite the fact that there were no invitations for the Riva party, Kit did actually send one invitation every year, sometime in mid-August, she would take a piece of notebook paper and write down the date and the time and the address. And then she would write, you are cordially invited to the Riva party, and she would address it to her father, Mick Riva, 380 North Carrollwood Drive, Los Angeles, California 90077. After decades on the road, he had settled down in a home in Holmby Hills, less than 30 miles from his children. Five years ago, Kit had tracked him down. And since then, every single year, she addressed that envelope the exact same way. Mick slipped his dress shoes on, grabbed his keys, and walked out the door, he got in his brand new black Jaguar and put his foot on the gas. He sped down Sunset Boulevard, toward the ocean, with a handwritten invitation sitting on the passenger's seat. It was just after midnight when Wendy Palmer took off her dress and slipped off her underwear. She stood there, bare, in the backyard, just to the side of the jacuzzi, and then began to slowly step down into the steaming water, the far corner of the jacuzzi was in the far corner of the pool, which was in the far corner of the lawn. So only a few people saw her, at first, soon, Wendy was submerged in the bubbling water, floating over to the only other people in the jacuzzi at that moment, the two men stopped talking to each other in order to look at her. She smiled and raised her eyebrows ever so slightly. Hi, 
Stephen Cross and Nick Marnell both stared at her, instantly intrigued. They were the bassist and drummer of a British new wave band with the number three song in the country. This was not the first time they'd found themselves in a jacuzzi with a naked woman, hi, Nick said, hello, Stephen said slowly, Wendy kissed Nick first. And then, Stephen. And then moved them all into a spot where people could watch, before continuing with her plan, are we really doing this? Nick mouthed to Stephen, and Stephen shrugged, and so it began. Just as Wendy wanted, Wendy had come to the party with the intention of having sex with two hot guys while people watched. She didn't want people to watch her for their sake. She wasn't trying to entertain anyone. She was not there for anyone's amusement but her own. This was something she'd always wanted to do. She'd thought about doing it from time to time when she got a little too drunk or found herself pressed up against a man. Wishing they weren't alone. But she'd known when she woke up that morning that if she was ever actually going to do it, it had to be tonight, because the Riva party was Wendy's last hurrah, it was time to leave Los Angeles. She had made the decision to give up on her acting career, quit her job at Riva's Seafood, and end the lark once and for all. Soon, her partying days would be over, too. She'd grown homesick for Oregon. And she had finally decided that it was time to go home and marry the son of her father's best friend, his name was Charles, and he had loved her since they were children. She, a waif-like blonde girl with a headband. He, a brown-haired, round-faced sweetheart who always picked up his toys. Now, Wendy was small-town gorgeous in a big city. And Charles was losing his hair at the age of 26, last Christmas, Charles had confessed to Wendy that he still loved her. If you told me to wait, I would. He'd said in the hallway of her parents' house on Christmas Eve, just as her mother was setting the ham down for dinner. I'd wait if there was even a small chance, Wendy had kissed Charles on his cheekbone. And they'd both walked away from it suspecting she would make her way back to him, when she returned to LA right after New Year's, she could smell the smog the second she landed at the airport. Her studio apartment depressed her. She kept being called into audition for the roles of nagging girlfriends and nagging wives. She kept losing the parts to valley girls who raised their voices at the ends of their sentences as if everything they said was a question. The only part she scored was to writhe around in a bikini on top of a sports car. They had teased her hair with so much aqua net, she had to wash it four times afterward, when her agent told her that at the age of 26 she was too old to play Harrison Ford's girlfriend. Wendy knew she was going home, she would marry the sweet man with the thinning hair and the money. And she would have kind-hearted children, whom she would love with all of her heart. And she would probably gain some weight. She would lose herself for long stretches of time, when the rush of dance recitals and sleepovers and basketball games took over with such force that her own personality began to drift away. But that was all okay by her. That life now sounded sort of wonderful. This morning, she had booked a one-way ticket to Portland. She was leaving LA for good next Tuesday, but first, she needed to fuck two rock stars in a jacuzzi while everyone watched, Lara had gone to the bathroom at least ten minutes ago, so Jay was killing time. He was by the fireplace in the living room talking to Matt Palakiko, a retired surfer. As a teenager, Jay had idolized Matt. He'd even stuck some of the photos of Matt's greatest waves on his bedroom wall. But now Matt was a father to twins and lived back home on the big island of Hawaii. He was in LA for the week taking meetings about licensing his name for swimwear, Jay was listening to Matt talk about how the purity of surfing had returned to him when he stopped competing. But that's a ways off for you, man. You have a long career ahead of you, Matt said. Everybody's saying so, thank you, Jay said, nodding, and, look, if you play it right, a decade from now you could be doing some of the shit I'm doing, putting your name on stuff, taking paychecks. Everyone's throwing money around now. It's like there's too much of it all of a sudden. It's all just gonna get bigger and bigger. And I'm telling you, 
sometimes the financial security and the peace is even sweeter than the victory. I get up every day and surf because I want to. Not because I have to. Do you know how long it's been since I could say that, right, Jay said. I bet, when it's just you and the wave, and you're not thinking about stats or training or... Jay was half listening, fixated on his uncertain future, the one he still could not bear to say out loud to anyone but Lara. His retirement wouldn't be like Matt's. He had to retire and give up the act itself. There was no real purity to exchange for what he was losing. He was just losing everything. Jay had only begun to be considered one of the best, his career was just taking off. It had been for only a couple years he'd even had all of this attention. But it had not taken him long to acclimate to the adulation. And now, his heart was going to cost him the very thing that made him feel exceptional, he was the eldest son of Mick Riva, wasn't he supposed to be the best at something? For a moment, Jay considered the idea that he would rather die being great than live being ordinary. He wasn't sure he could bear the stain of obscurity, look, I gotta head out. Matt said, looking at his watch. I got a flight back home in the morning. If I miss it, my wife will kill me, all right, man, take care, Jay said. And then he added, I'd love to come out there and pick your brain sometime. You know, about the boards you're shaping. What you're up to now that you're, you know, old, Jay smiled. Retired, sure thing, man. Talk soon. Just as Matt walked away, Jay felt a hand intertwine itself with his, sorry, the line took forever, Lara said. There are way too many people at this party. Is it always like this? Jay looked around, taking note of the bodies in the rest of the house. People were starting to pack themselves tight into small spaces. Couples had taken refuge on the stairs and girls were sitting on the floor. Through the windows it was plain to see that the front lawn was as packed as the back, actually. Jay said. This is a lot. Even for this party, is there somewhere more quiet we can go? Lara asked, yeah, Jay said. Of course. What were you thinking? The beach, the beach feels a little. Lara made a face that Jay tried desperately to discern. What did she mean? The beach was too romantic. Too cheesy. Too cold. Too dark. He wasn't sure. All right, Jay said and he took her by the hand and out the front door, past the partiers, past the valets, and then into the relative quiet darkness of the makeshift parking lot the attendants had made of his sister's side yard, he walked right past two people making out with a fervor that struck him as immensely funny until he realized it was Kit's friend Vanessa and that DJ they'd hired. He instantly looked away and then found himself looking back, stunned at the intensity. He had no idea Vanessa had it in her, uh, Jay said, trying to forget what he'd seen. Let's go to Hud's truck. Jay's own car had no top and no doors, but he knew Hud's truck would be unlocked. They headed straight for it, Jay didn't just want to get Lara alone because he wanted to have sex with her. Yes, if Lara made a move on him, if she laid her long bare legs across him, he would strike. But he also wanted to talk to her. He wanted to ask her how she had been and what she was up to and did she think she would still like him if he was a nobody? He wanted to find out where she grew up and what her favorite movie was, Jay came upon Hud's truck in the second row, toward the very back of the pack. He pulled Lara toward it, and opened the door for her. There wasn't much room and Lara had to squeeze into the ten-inch crack between door and frame. She managed. And when Jay shut the door behind him, they were finally alone, hi, Jay said, hi. Lara smiled, then neither of them said anything more. They simply looked at each other. Comfortable and silent. You're different than I thought you'd be, Lara said, finally, what does that mean? Jay asked. He shifted slightly so he could face her, bending his knee and resting his leg on the bench seat, Lara shrugged softly. You're much calmer than I figured, calmer? Jay asked. 
He was eager to know how he seemed to her, eager to see himself reflected in her eyes. Lara laughed. You seemed arrogant, she said. Before I really knew you. And I don't seem arrogant to you now? It was a new feeling, this desire to glean what the other person wanted from you and then find a way to be it. If she liked arrogance, he would play it up. If she didn't, he'd be the most humble guy she'd ever met, Lara shook her head. And you're quieter than I thought, too, you thought I was a loud dickhead, Jay said, smiling, Lara laughed and lifted her hand to her earring, playing with it. I did, she said, are you disappointed? Jay asked, no, I'm not disappointed. That's not what I meant at all, Lara said. Her voice was reassuring. I guess what I'm saying is that people are surprising. I always thought you were cute even when you were a loud dickhead. But I like that you're not. You're more complicated than that, Jay knew this was a compliment despite the fact that he had never aspired to complexity. Complicated, huh? I don't know about that. What had happened to all the artificial indifference he normally relied on? Maybe this was the new him. Maybe he was becoming more like HUD, HUD was always better with women than Jay. Jay slept with more women, hotter women, too. But HUD knew how to love them. Jay hadn't known to be envious of that kind of skill until now. Until all he wanted was to know Lara, earn her trust, could they take vacations together? Would she come to Hawaii? His days surfing the North Shore were probably over but could he teach her to surf in the gentle, non-threatening waves of Waikiki? He wanted to bring her to his favorite cafe in Honolua Bay. He wanted to order her hapia, I've been trying to impress you, Jay admitted, impress me? Lara said. There was delight in the wrinkle of her eyes, in the curved edges of her lips, yeah, Jay said, nodding. His head was down but his eyes were up and focused right on her. Ever since, that night, Lara said, yeah, ever since that night, I haven't been able to stop thinking about you, you haven't? Jay knew he was a fish on a hook, that she was reeling him in. He wanted to be reeled in. It felt good to be drawn in, to become intoxicated. It was the first time he'd ever desired someone so strongly, and he liked the feeling, the sweet ache of this specific wanting, I can't stop thinking about you, he said. I've, I've gone into the sandcastle I don't even know how many times, trying to run into you, I know, she said, smiling. He had been exposed and it thrilled them both, he leaned toward her and put his lips to the spot on her cheekbone that bumped right up to her eye. It was hard like bone and smooth like velvet, is it crazy to think I might love you? Jay whispered in her ear, it sounds a little crazy. Yeah, Lara, said, laughing. You don't know me, all that well, Jay was barely listening to her. He was lost, in the commotion of his own heart, I don't know. He said, kissing her collarbone and running his hands up her legs. I think I know enough, he kissed her on the mouth and held her in the front seat of his brother's truck. He thought of what they were about to do as more than just sex. It was a way for him to show her what he felt for her. It was a connection, a sacred act. He put his hands slowly up Lara's shirt, unbuttoned his pants, kicked off his shoes. Lara's skirt was pushed up to her hips. And Jay slipped his hands underneath. He gingerly, and with great appreciation, slipped her underwear off. Leaving it hanging at her feet, do you have a condom? Lara asked, he didn't but he figured HUD might have some in the car. He turned to the dashboard and grabbed the keys from where the valet had left them. He took the smallest key and fit it in the glove box. With a turn, the box fell open with a thud. And there were condoms. Three. All in a row, in their shiny foil packets. Jay picked them up, ready to tear one off, but then... Jay grabbed the photo in the glove box that had now entered his field of vision, only to see that it was a full stack of photos. Photos of his ex-girlfriend blowing his brother, photos that broke his already malfunctioning heart, Hud and Ashley had taken their shoes off and neither one of them knew where they'd left them. 
They had walked so far down the beach that they did not exactly recognize where they were in the dark. Hud had already asked her a list of questions. How long have you known? Three days. How far along? Seven weeks. Was it the weekend we went to La Jolla? I think so. Are we ready to be parents? I don't know how to know something like that, and now, as they walked hand in hand along the water. They were both quietly considering two futures, one with a baby and one without, Hud was thinking about renting a house, an airstream was no place to raise a child. He was thinking about a two-bedroom and he imagined himself painting a nursery yellow. He thought of the sort of master bedroom his mother had. He had always liked that it had two sinks in the bathroom. He had always liked the idea of a mother and a father, together, at those sinks, every night, Hud suddenly stopped, and Ashley stopped with him, what's the first thing you thought, he asked her. When you found out? When the test tube turned whatever color it turns, it's a ring that appears at the bottom, well, then, when the ring appeared. What was the first thought that popped into your head, well, what was the first thing in your head? When I told you? Ashley said. Honestly, yes, I thought, how is it possible to love something that fast? Because I feel like the minute you said it, I felt it. And that doesn't make any sense at all, Ashley's eyes started to water and when she smiled, a tear fell, you didn't think, oh shit, or fuck, or how do I get out of this? Ashley asked, wiping her tears away, no, Hud said, pulling her toward him. Did you, no, she said, shaking her head. Not once, so we're having a baby, Hud said, holding her, we're having a baby, and they stood there, the cold water swirling up and chilling their ankles, smiling at each other, there would be rocking chairs and swaddles, mashed bananas and high chairs, the pride of a first step. There would be a wild and beautiful future, but for now, right now, Hud had no choice but to stop dancing around a lie. His families, old and brand new, were his to reconcile, his to fight and fight for. And he would do that now. He did not necessarily feel up to the task, but that hardly mattered, should we turn back, he asked, Ashley looked up at him and gave him a gentle smile. She leaned into him farther, held his hand tighter. All right, she said, it was time to tell Jay the truth. 1 a.m., Brandon was in the guest bathroom of his own home looking in the mirror. He was pretty buzzed already, heading straight to drunk. And he was staring at himself wondering how he had made so many mistakes in such a small span of time, how could he have done all of this to Nina? She had weathered so many things so young and he had always liked to think of himself as the beginning of good things for her. He liked to think that maybe, in some small way, he was her knight in shining armor, and then, like a moron, he'd started sleeping with Carrie Soto. There should be a way to undo your fuck-ups. Not just redeem yourself for them but actually undo them, make them so that they never happened. He wanted to take back every second of heartbreak he'd caused his wife. She did not deserve any of it, had done nothing to deserve his complete and disastrous breakdown. He wished the world would let them all just pretend the whole thing never happened, Brandon stared into the mirror and looked at his face, looked at the lines that had started to form. Every day of your life feels like you're climbing up the mountain. And then you get there and you stay for a bit. And it's nice at the top. But then you start sliding down the other side, he hadn't seen that part coming. And it had hit him hard, this had all started because, nine months ago, Brandon had been the number one seed in the Australian Open. Then he lost in the second round in an upset to a 17-year-old Scandinavian named Anders Larsson. From his first serve, Brandon had begun to worry that he was spinning out. He used his signature slingshot, something very few players could return. It cut fast and clean across the court, but Larson returned it, it knocked Brandon off his feet, having to volley back and forth for the point. Point went to Larson. So did the next one, the serve after that, he double faulted. He found himself growing angry, looking at this teenager in front of him. The crowd started muttering, some of them cheering for Larson, 
Larson smiled at Brandon as he waited, crouched over and ready, it went through Brandon's mind that all the papers were anticipating Brandon and Creek in the finals but now it was looking like he might not even make it past round two, he began overthinking. His shoulder started feeling tight. For a moment it was as if his muscles did not remember. His serve got looser, slower. Every time he hit a forehand without spin, without precision, he grew more and more angry. Every backhand that missed his intended mark pushed him further into his own head and out of the game, break point, when he missed the return on Larson's last volley, he instantly felt the cameras on him. He'd felt this way before, trapped by the camera. The feeling had been manageable enough to shake off when the camera had caught him in victory, or even in a loss to a worthy opponent. But this had been a slaughter. He was Goliath and he had just lost to David, Larson turned to the stands and shook his fists in the air, having beaten the current number one player in the world. The crowd cheered, Brandon, as he usually did in his rare moments like this, held his face tight, showing no sign of distress. He walked, his whole body tense, to the net. But this time, try as he might, he could not muster a smile as he shook that little fuck's hand, he knew his father would have been disappointed by his lack of sportsmanship. But that was the least of his problems, as he slinked into the locker room, his coach, Tommy, trailed behind him. What the fuck was that? I've never seen you so in your head. You don't have much time left on the court if that's all you have to bring. Brandon was silent, his heart pounding. Tommy shook his head and left. And when he was gone, Brandon punched a hole in the wall of the men's locker room, obviously, he'd lost before. But in the second round of a tournament he was supposed to win, Brandon had gone home to Nina. But the second he opened the front door and saw her, he could not stand the look on her face. Her eyes were wide and welcoming, her mouth was turned down softly in a kind frown. How are you doing, she had asked him, he'd wanted to jump out of his skin. Nina had put her arms around him and hugged him. And then, she'd put her hand to his face. You are a great man, she'd said. You've already proven that. I mean, you have ten grand slams. That's unbelievable, Brandon had taken her hand and moved it away from his face. Thank you, he'd said, as he got up and went to take a shower. He could not bear to look at her, next up, in January, he was out in the third round at the US Pro Indoor. Fucking McEnroe. Then he lost in straight sets at the Davis Cup in March, the US team didn't even make it to the quarterfinals. At the Don A Open, he lost in the semi-finals and chucked his racket on the ground. It made headlines. He pulled out of Monte Carlo on account of his shoulder, Brandon stopped coming home directly after his matches. He told Nina he had to visit his mother or his brother in New York. He made plans for himself and Tommy to stay longer in Buenos Aires and Nice. When he did finally come home, he would talk to Nina about dinner, and the restaurant, and her siblings, and his travel plans, and her schedule, and what art to buy for the downstairs den. He would not talk to her about tennis. He would not tell her his shoulder was killing him. He would sneak out to doctor's appointments, never told her he'd begun getting cortisone shots. He was supposed to be indestructible. He was supposed to be humble despite being brilliant, affable despite his sheer domination on the court. He was not supposed to be out in the early rounds and pitted by his wife, enter, Carrie Soto, Carrie Soto was considered the greatest female tennis player of all time. Brandon had met Carrie before but they had never had a conversation until one day back in May in Paris. He was at the French Open without Nina because he'd insisted she stay home, he was sitting on a bench outside the locker room at Roland Garros just before his first match, adjusting the sweatband on his head. Carrie Soto walked by him, with her tense body and perfect posture in her tennis whites, her dark hair was pulled back. Under her visor. Her rosy skin, wide eyes, and button nose made her seem cute. But then when she got an earshot of Brandon, she leaned over and said to him, your nice guy routine doesn't fool me. 
You're as bloodthirsty as the rest of us. Get your serve in line and murder them all. Brandon turned and looked at her, his eyes wide, she smiled at him. And he smiled back, Brandon won his first match. Then another. And by the skin of his teeth, over the course of two weeks, he earned the Coupes de Mousquetaires. When he won the last match of the finals, he pumped his fist into the air, meanwhile, Carrie Soto crushed every single opponent she had with force and determination. She grunted with every serve, yelped as she volleyed. Dove with abandon, smearing her tennis whites with the red clay of the court. And she won the Coupe de Suzanne Lenglen, the night after he won, Brandon ran into Carrie at their hotel, the two of them raging champions pacing in an elevator. Brandon felt victorious and vulnerable, gleeful and unguarded, I told you you could be vicious, Carrie said, grinning, I guess you've got my number, Brandon said, there was a pause as the elevator rose. When it stopped at Brandon's floor, he said, let me know if you want to split something from the minibar, ten minutes later they were in his room, Carrie Soto was on top of him, and he could feel her muscles in his hands. He could feel, as she moved, how hard her thighs were, how tight her butt was, how swollen her calves and forearms were. He could feel, as he touched her, her strength and agility. He was holding her power in his hands, and for one small moment, while he was lying underneath her, he thought he'd found the other half of himself, when he woke up the next morning, his head throbbed with the realization of what he had done. But just before Carrie left Paris, she told him she thought, just maybe. This could be something serious. And that made him wonder if all of this wasn't just cheating but perhaps something else, like a love affair, he'd never thought it before, but maybe Nina was wrong for him. Maybe that was why she made him feel so small. And maybe Carrie was right for him. That was why she made him feel so strong, so he kept seeing her. In LA, in New York, in London. And soon Brandon had convinced himself that Carrie was his good luck charm, after they both won at Wimbledon, Brandon was flying high. He'd won clay and grass courts in the same year. Nearly unheard of. This, Tommy said, is the Brandon I know, the tabloids caught Carrie and him celebrating their wins together that night outside the Wimbledon ball. He was in a tux. Carrie was in a navy blue gown. They were kissing beside a car. His hand was on her ass, Carrie saw the photos first and bought off the photographer and the magazine. She traded the photos for an exclusive with her. But afterward, she told Brandon that she was in love with him and it was time to shit or get off the pot. Brandon felt rushed. He wasn't sure he was ready to commit to leaving Nina. But he was at a crossroads in more ways than one, and he suspected that if he stayed with Nina, happiness and satisfaction might just soften him too much, enough that he might not fight hard enough against the descent of his talent, if he stayed with Carrie, the best of his times on the court might be yet to come, so, Brandon flew home. He walked into his massive house and headed right up the stairs to get his things, he was hoping Nina wasn't home. But he found her in the bedroom, reading a travel guide to Bora Bora. She was wearing his boxer shorts. He could barely look at her, hi, honey, she said, sweetly, he went straight to the closet. He had to move fast, he had to get this over with quickly for the both of them. And he did not think he could bear to look at her. He was not sure he'd keep his nerve. I'm sorry, Nina, he said. But I'm leaving, what are you talking about, she said, the bubbliness still in her voice, he did not remember what she said after that. He had simply run away, he went right to the Beverly Hills Hotel. And when he got to Carrie's suite, he kissed her at her front door and said, I love you. I choose you, the whole thing with Nina had been hideous and unbearable. But it had been necessary. And it was done, Brandon stayed with Carrie and found that an entire new life had been mapped out for him within days. In the mornings, they would both have protein smoothies and a handful of raw almonds and then go to the gym together. They started training at the same court side by side at the Bel Air Country Club. Brandon's cortisone shot was wearing off sooner than he'd anticipated, 
but if at any time Brandon started to slow down his serves or miss a few volleys in a row, Carrie would notice and yell to him from her court, without missing a beat of her own, get it together, Randall. You're either a champion or a fuck-up. There is no in-between. And he would run faster, hit more cleanly, in the afternoon, they dealt with business, calling their agents, discussing endorsement deals, approving travel, sending correspondence, by seven every evening, they were out the door, ready to go to dinner. The two of them were usually at a party, charity function, or gala by nine. They talked almost exclusively about how much Carrie hated her rival, Paulina Stepanova. One night, in the middle of the night, Brandon woke up with his shoulder throbbing. They'd had an intense practice in the morning and a gala for Cedar sinai Medical Center in the evening, and then they'd come home and made love before turning out the lights, suddenly, at three in the morning, the pain was excruciating. He called down for ice, but it did not do much to help. He popped a few meds. But the pain was getting sharper, throbbing harder, he woke Carrie up, in a panic. What if Wimbledon was my last slam, he asked her. That would be catastrophic, Carrie said. You only have twelve. And then she turned her body away from his and went to bed, he ached for the tenderness of Nina, he fell asleep just in time to wake up to Carrie throwing a towel at him. Do we cry about the pain? Or do we man up and play through it? Carr leaves for the court in fifteen, he got up, got dressed, and kept her pace all day. And then the next and the next and on it went. Brandon had lived his life beside Carrie for another four weeks and two days. But then, again last night, the ache in his shoulder had woken him up. This time it was a searing, burning pain. Every second before the meds kicked in was agonizing. He had made an appointment for another shot and he knew that would help for a little while. But he understood, in some disturbingly clear way, that the clock was ticking. Even if he staved off the decline as long as possible, even if he won more championships than any other human in history, someday, his body was going to break down, because everyone's did. And who would love him then, it took him two and a half hours, to fall asleep. And then that morning, he had been woken up at six o'clock, to hear Carrie talking to room service saying, don't send salted nuts. I don't want salt in the morning. You sent salted nuts yesterday after I asked you three times not to. If you can't send the right type of nuts, maybe you should be in another field of work. Then she hung up the phone, Brandon had laid his head back on his pillow. She was not a kind person. He wasn't even sure she was a good person. Before he knew what he was doing he opened his mouth. Oh my god, he said. You're awful. What the fuck have I done? He got out of bed and started gesticulating wildly, going on about what an uptight ice woman she was. I've made every wrong turn a person could make, he said, standing in his boxers. I don't think I love you. I'm not sure I have ever loved you. Why would I think this was where I wanted to be? I don't want to be with a woman who screams at people, Carrie stared at him like he had two heads. And then she said, no one is making you stay here. You gigantic fucking prick, Brandon considered her words and realized she was right. No one had made him sleep with her. No one had made him leave his wife for her. He'd done it all himself. But he simply could not, for the life of him, remember why any of that had felt like such a good idea. I think I should go, he said, be my guest, Carrie said, gesturing to the door. And feel free to fuck right off, Brandon grabbed his things and left, he trained that morning at a different court. He took a long, punishingly hot shower. Then he sat in the locker room in his towel for an hour, immobile, considering what to do, all he could think of was how good it felt when Nina rubbed her hands through his hair, or the look on her face when she told him she'd love him forever, right then and there, he had made up his mind to get her back, and he had. And now everything would be okay. As long as Carrie Soto left them alone, Nina and Casey were sitting in silence when someone opened the door, Nina, they both turned to see Tareen. You need to come downstairs, she said, why, it is Carrie Soto, Nina was already tired. What about her, 
she is on your front lawn throwing clothes and threatening to light them on fire. Nina started down the stairs, making her way through the crowd with Tareen. Greg Robinson had the music up so loud it was shaking the ground, vibrating the very foundation of the house. People were dancing with such fervor in the living room that the picture frames were bouncing against the walls, it was Nina's house, Nina's carpet they were standing on. Her stairs supporting them, her booze they were drinking, her food they were eating. And yet, each person in Nina's way remained in her way until she tapped them on the shoulder or nudged herself through. She found herself growing more and more annoyed. Her husband's mistress was on the front lawn and she couldn't even get outside to deal with it because there was a group of pro surfers smoking pot in her foyer, excuse me. Tareen said. Get out of the way. The surfers moved immediately, when Nina finally made her way to the front of the house, she looked out to the driveway to see her husband trying to calm a woman who was waving her arms around and ranting, Carrie Soto, in white track pants and a white and green t-shirt was standing on the gravel in her driveway with Brandon's clothes dumped in a pile. Nina could see Brandon's favorite black Ralph Lauren polo off to the side, saw his lucky white sweatband lying on the rocks. He loved that sweatband, he came back to me but left his sweatband with her, Brandon, I swear to God, you need to stop being such an asshole. I really might just burn all of your shit to the ground, Carrie said. The crowd outside was entirely focused on Carrie, giving her a wide berth. People were coming around from the sides of the house to see what the commotion was. Nina could feel the people behind her peering over her head to see more, Carrie, please, Brandon was saying. He was standing just at the foot of the steps, his arms up in defense. Let's talk about this like adults, Carrie started laughing. Not maniacally, not angrily but rather with genuine amusement. I am the adult, Brandon. I am the one who told you not to leave your wife unless you were serious about us, do you remember that? Brandon started to say more, but Carrie interrupted. Do you remember me telling you that I would not allow myself to be a homewrecker unless you and I were truly in love? That this was forever? Do you remember me telling you that? Brandon nodded. Yes. But Carrie, no, don't, yes, but, me. You're an asshole, Brandon. Do you get that, Carrie, what did I tell you when we first slept together, Brandon? What did I say? Did I say to you that I wasn't going to sleep with another woman's husband unless it was for something real, yes, but, and did I tell you that you better not fuck with my heart? Did I tell you that, Brandon, Carrie, I believe my exact words, you son of a bitch, or, if I fall in love with you, don't fuck me over. I don't know if, no, don't argue with me. That is what I said, okay, that is what you said. But, you woke up this morning after making love to me the night before and when I got off the phone with room service to order us raw almonds. You said, and I quote, oh my god. You're awful. What the fuck have I done? And then you left, Carrie. Please. Can we talk about this in private? Carrie looked around, taking in the crowd that was forming. Then she looked behind Brandon, to the front door, where she saw Nina. Her face fell. Brandon turned and saw Nina, too. Nina, he said, Nina, Carrie interrupted. I am sorry. I shouldn't have taken up with him and I shouldn't be airing all of this dirty laundry and ruining your party. Nina continued staring at Carrie but didn't say anything. How was it that this woman could shout out every thought running through her head? Why was it that Carrie Soto felt entitled to scream, in that moment, Nina was not mad or jealous or embarrassed or anything else she might have expected? Nina was sad. Sad that she'd never lived a fraction of a second like Carrie Soto. What a world she must live in, Nina thought where you can piss and moan and stomp your feet and cry in public and yell at the people who hurt you. That you can dictate what you will and will not accept, Nina, her entire life, had been programmed to accept. Accept that your father left. Accept that your mother is gone. Accept that you must take care of your siblings. Accept that the world wants to lust after you. 
accept accept accept. For so long, Nina had believed it was her greatest strength, that she could withstand, that she could endure, that she would accept it all and keep going. It was so foreign to her, the idea of declaring that something was unacceptable, Nina thought of herself driving to someone else's house to scream on their front lawn while a whole party's worth of people watched. It was so impossible that she couldn't even summon a mental picture. But Carrie had this fire within her. Where was Nina's fire? Had it ever been there? And if so, when did it go out? Her husband had slept with Carrie last night and then Nina had taken him back this evening. What was wrong with her? Was she just going to accept it all? Just accept every piece of bullshit thrown at her for the rest of her life, when Nina opened her mouth to speak, her voice was flat and calm and controlled. I think you two need to leave, she said, Brandon wasn't sure he'd heard her right. Carrie didn't hear her at all. I think you two need to leave, Nina said again, this time louder, honey, no, Brandon said, trying to move toward her, Nina put up her hand. No. Nope, she said calmly. Leave me out of this. You two can have each other, I don't want him, Carrie said. I just wanted him to know that you can't treat people like dirt and think they are just going to take it, Nina hated how small she felt in that moment, for having taken him back, how dare you come to this house. Tareen said to Carrie. Her voice was loud and angry and when Nina looked at her, she could tell that Tareen had been seething for quite some time, for what it's worth, I hate myself, Carrie said to Nina and Tareen. And I know I shouldn't be here. I'm just really sick and tired of people thinking they can treat me like I don't have a heart. Like mine doesn't break, too, Nina looked at her and nodded. She understood Carrie Soto, understood she was heartbroken, understood that in another world they might even be friends. But they were in this world. And they were not friends, you have no right going around acting like you're Mr. Nice Guy. You're an asshole. Carrie said to Brandon. All I wanted to do was give you back your stuff and tell you that. But then you pissed me off trying to shoo me away like some shameful secret. Like you didn't come on to me. Like you didn't start this whole thing, Carrie turned around and walked back to her Bentley, which she'd left running. The driver's door, still open. I'm sorry, everyone, she said. I really am, she backed her car up, bumped against a palm tree, put it in drive, and took off, Brandon watched her drive out of sight, and then, wearing a look of shock and embarrassment, moved toward his wife, Nina put up her hands again, in front of everyone. You need to go, too, Nina, honey, it's over with Carrie, I don't care. Please, Brandon, just go, Nina was relieved to hear herself say it, relieved she was capable of this. You can't kick me out. Brandon said. It's my house. This is my house, so then take the house, Nina said. It's yours, and the moment she relinquished that stupid cliffside monstrosity and the tennis star that came with it, Nina Riva felt 100 times lighter, there was finally enough air within her for a fire to ignite, Casey Greens looked at herself in the mirror of Nina's master bathroom, splashing her face with cold water and then drying it with a lush taupe towel. Everything in this house was so nice. The towels were so soft, the rooms were so big. She looked at the floor-to-ceiling windows and the mirrored walls and the thousand-thread count pillowcases, but Casey ached for her old world. Where the pillows were a little scratchy and the windows were small and always sort of stuck with humidity and old paint, where dinner was always a little overcooked. Where her mom got every question wrong on Jeopardy. Every night, but they all sat on the couch together and had fun listening to her guess hopelessly anyway, if Casey could, if the devil ever bartered, she would have sold her soul to leave this place and have her parents back. She felt a wave of despair coming toward her, ready to take her under. This had been happening on and off since she lost them. Casey had learned that the best thing to do was to brace herself for every rush of grief. She would let the sadness and sorrow wash over her, smother her. She held on tight, knowing all she could do was feel the pain until it passed, 
she opened her eyes and looked at herself in the mirror once more, maybe she didn't belong here. Maybe she didn't belong anywhere, wouldn't belong anywhere. Ever again. Nina walked back into the house trying to pretend she had not just suffered the indignity of her husband's mistress on her front lawn. And then she went right through the kitchen, opened up the pantry door, and walked in, there, among the bags of rice and the cans of tomato sauce, Nina closed her eyes and settled herself. While the pantry door hummed with the sounds of the eurythmics and the noise of people talking and laughing still penetrated the space, it was quiet enough to find stillness. Nina rested her famous ass on a stack of paper towel rolls and pulled her shoulder blades in toward each other, fixing her posture, releasing some of the tension from her back, for fuck's sake. Her husband had returned. His mistress had shown up, she might have a long-lost sister, and her brother was sleeping with her other brother's ex-girlfriend. She just wanted the night to be over, the pantry door opened, showering Nina with light and sound. She looked up to see Tareen standing in front of her with a bottle of wine and two glasses, hi, doll, Tareen said as she slipped in and shut the door behind her. She pulled on the cord hanging above their heads. The light went on, Brandon is upstairs, packing up your things, Tareen said. He is drunk, obviously. And he thinks he is kicking you out of the house, Nina laughed. She had no choice but to find it funny, Tareen sat down next to Nina and grabbed a corkscrew from her jacket pocket. She started opening up the bottle of Sauvignon Blanc. Once the cork was popped, she poured some wine into a glass and handed it to Nina, then poured one for herself, someone took the rest of the Opus 1, Tareen said. These people are animals. I got us a white this time, Nina took it but didn't drink out of it yet, drink up, Tareen said as she took a sip of her own. We are celebrating your declaration of independence, Nina looked at Tareen and a small smile crept out of the corner of her mouth. She took a sip. And then, she drank some more. Good God, she could drink the whole bottle right now, I didn't expect him to come back, Nina said, I know. Once he left, I don't know, our relationship felt over for me. I was mourning it, rightfully so, and I've been really sad, Nina added. That I, that I meant so little to someone who had made me believe I meant so much, Tareen grabbed Nina's hand and squeezed it, but there was no part of me that wanted him back, Nina said, finally looking Tareen in the eye, Tareen smiled. Good, she said with a firm nod, Nina lifted her wine glass to her lips again. She could smell the sweet astringency of the contents of the glass and she felt like she could get lost in it. And then she had this image, suddenly, of her mother on the couch in front of the television. Her blood ran cold, Nina put the glass down. When he showed up here tonight, do you know what I thought, she said, what, I went, oh fuck, now we have to do this whole song and dance, Tareen smiled. But you do not, no, Nina said. I don't, do I? She didn't have to do any of this. The victimization, the acceptance of bullshit, the leaving your heart in the hands of an asshole yet again. She could just decide not to, Nina smiled. She had to sit with that one for a moment. It was almost too good to be true. Jay dropped the photos back into the glove box and tried to pretend that he hadn't seen them. That it hadn't happened. That it wasn't true. That his brother wouldn't do that dot he must be misunderstanding the photos. He must be. Because he could not possibly believe that his brother was not only that much of an asshole but also that much of a liar, he tried to put the thoughts out of his head by moving on top of Lara, by refocusing his attention on her. But as he put his hand up her skirt, as he unzipped his own pants, the thought just kept reverberating in his head that he couldn't possibly deny what he'd seen with his own two eyes. Lara moved from under Jay and pushed him down onto the bench seat. He let her do whatever it was she wanted to do. Lost in his own thoughts, hoping desperately she could take him somewhere else, Lara climbed on top of him and began to move, her shirt lifted to expose her breasts, her skirt around her hips. The top of her head kept hitting the ceiling of the truck and Jay, trying so very hard to focus on Lara, couldn't help but wonder if Hud had fucked Ashley in this truck just like this. 
If Ashley's head had also hit the ceiling, when they were both done, Lara leaned off him, pulled down her shirt and her skirt, and said, you're nearly catatonic. What's the matter? Jay looked at her as he sat up. I think my brother is sleeping with my ex-girlfriend, he said. And lying about it. Earlier tonight, he sold me some bullshit about wanting to ask her out. And I said no. And now I find out he's probably been fucking her this whole time, Lara sat up straighter, surprised. I'm sorry, she said, putting her hand on his back. Jay's anger raged inside his chest, but Lara's soothing hand helped calm him. If I had to find out about this shit, I'm glad it's with you, he said. Lara smiled, but Jay noticed that it didn't look very sincere. It was like the smile you give to the guy who bags your groceries. I meant what I said earlier, he said. About thinking I might love you, Jay. She said, I guess I'm saying that I do, love you. I love you, Jay was expecting Lara to smile or get a little weepy or blush. Women had pressured him to say it before and he never had. But now here he was, saying it. And he was excited for whatever would come next, however happy it would make her. But, instead, he watched as her eyes went blank and her smile stiffened, I, I don't know that we feel the same way about each other, she said, Jay shook his head, confused. Wait, what, I'm sorry, Jay's face hardened slowly but steadily, from a warm, languid pool to a glacier. Wow, he said, stunned, Jay, I really am sorry. I think I misunderstood what you were looking for, I wasn't looking for anything, he said, moving away from her, putting his shoes back on. But clearly you're not the person I thought you were, so whatever, Jay, that's not, no, I should have known, he said as he opened the driver's side door and hopped out of the truck. He stood with both feet on the ground, looking at Lara, who had not moved from her seat. That's why I didn't tell anybody about us. Because I knew you were this kind of girl. I knew you weren't the kind of girl you marry, Jay could think of no bigger insult and so he felt he'd reclaimed some sense of power after lobbing it at her. But she seemed unfazed, all right, Lara said. Putting her hand on the door handle, get out of my brother's car, Jay said, his voice rising, please be careful, Lara said as she got up. I'm worried about your heart, Jay narrowed his eyes and slammed the door shut, I guess I should go, Lara said. They stood on either side of the truck looking at each other, I honestly don't care what you do, Jay said before walking away, swiftly at first, eager for distance. He slowed down when he got closer to the front door of the house. There were clothes all over the yard and people milling around, holding their drinks, smoking their cigarettes, all consumed with talking about something. But Jay wasn't listening, just as he got to the front door, he turned around, to see if Lara was still there, he saw her getting her car from the valet. She took her keys, got in the front seat, and began to drive off, when she turned onto the road and out of sight, Jay thought he'd feel better, but he didn't. Of course, he didn't, Mick took a right onto PCH off Chautauqua, but he did not bother to use his blinker. Speeding up the highway, ocean to his left, mountains to his right, he turned his attention briefly to the invitation, he found himself growing a tiny bit nervous. His heart beating in irregular rhythm, he was preparing his apologies in his head, framing and reframing his past actions to create a story his kids would understand, one they could forgive. Now was the time for them all to run down to the ocean and baptize themselves in the sea and start again, he was doing this for himself, yes. But he was doing this for them, too. What broken family, no matter how shattered or tattered or bruised beyond recognition, does not ache to be reunited? What child, no matter how lost or abandoned, does not ache to be loved, Mick pulled up to the red stoplight at Heathercliff Road. And when it turned green, he turned left without his blinker, Kit was standing in the outdoor bathroom staring at the stars. Ricky was sucking on her neck so hard she was pretty sure she was going to end up with a hickey, she couldn't look at him. She couldn't bear to. So she kept looking up at the night sky, trying to find the Big Dipper. Ricky could not believe his good fortune. He was here, making out with Kit Riva, in an outdoor shower. 
Kit Riva. In an outdoor shower. He wanted to take her out on romantic dates to Italian restaurants, and buy her flowers, and go surfing with her, and just generally be in her presence all the time, Ricky was so flabbergasted and ahead of himself, so enchanted and eager, that it was almost as if his excitement could sustain them both, almost, Ricky was no Don Juan but he'd been with women before. He'd had a high school dalliance, a college girlfriend. He knew how it felt when a girl was as excited to be with you as you were to be with her. And Ricky was starting to worry, because of the way Kit wasn't looking him in the eye. The way she kept freezing up when he touched her, the way she moved her pelvis farther from him, that she didn't really want to be here, Ricky stood back for a moment and tried to get Kit to look at him, but she averted her gaze, Kit? Ricky said, what? She asked, are you sure you want to do this? Why wouldn't I want to do this? Kit said, I don't know. Ricky shrugged. I was just getting the impression maybe you weren't into it. Well, I am, Kit said, okay, Ricky said. If you're sure, I'm sure, she said and she pulled him to her and kissed him again. Kit was hiding, and she knew it, she understood, very clearly, that once she admitted to herself she didn't like kissing Ricky. She would have to admit she didn't want to kiss men at all. That she didn't like their roughness, their smell, the coarseness of their faces. That she'd never once looked at a man and desired him, she knew that as soon as she pulled away from Ricky Esposito, she was going to have to accept that she had always, her entire life, desired softness. Curves and smooth skin and long hair and soft lips. She had always ached to be touched with gentle hands. Kissing Ricky felt all wrong because he wasn't Juliana Thompson. He wasn't Cheryl Nielsen. Or Violet North. He wasn't even Wendy Palmer, the waitress at the restaurant with whom Kit always felt a thrill when they shared a shift. She wished, for just one moment, he was that cocktail waitress she'd met earlier tonight, the one with the red hair. Caroline. But Kit kept kissing Ricky, hoping some internal desire would kick in, even though she knew that she had all the answers she'd been looking for, Kit knew now, in her heart, in her body, that she liked girls the way other girls like boys. All she had done this evening by finally kissing a boy was show herself just how much she'd never cared about kissing a boy at all. She pulled away from Ricky. You're right. I can't do this, okay, Ricky said, backing off. Sorry if I pushed you or anything, no, Kit said. It's fine. I. She wasn't sure how to finish her sentence and so, instead, she sat down on the bench in the shower, Ricky sat down next to her, I'm sorry, she said. I don't think I'm, this kind of person, what kind of person, Kit wasn't sure how to say it or even what she wanted to say. The sort of person that wants to make out with a dude in an outdoor shower right now, Ricky nodded, forlorn but keeping a smile on his face as best he could. Okay, he said. I got it, it's not you, Kit said, Ricky looked at her. She was finally looking him in the eye. But I should take the hint that this is probably it for us, huh? Kit smiled at him, kindly. I think maybe we should think of ourselves as friends, Ricky nodded and stared at his own feet, but, like, real friends, Kit added, trying to get his attention back. Like, I sincerely mean that. If I was going to like a guy, I think it would be you. Ricky cocked his head to the side, not quite sure what she was trying to tell him, Ricky. Kit said, unsure if she could even complete the sentence she was starting. But didn't she have to start somewhere? And wasn't this the safest place to start? With someone she could avoid for the rest of her life if need be? It really isn't you. It's, Ricky caught her eye line. It's what? You can tell me, honestly. I'm a really good listener, Kit closed her eyes and let it fly. What if I told you I like, girls? She opened her eyes, unsure what she might see on Ricky's face, Ricky was quiet for a moment. All Kit could discern was surprise, that makes sense. Girls are hot, he said, nodding. And then, he laughed. And Kit laughed, too. She threw her head back and cackled 
her shoulders moving up and down as the laugh ran through her. Ricky looked up at her and felt even more drawn in, the way her eyes looked so warm and bright, the way her smile created little dimples on her cheeks. He had been so close to the girl he'd always wanted. And now he understood it truly was never going to happen. But that's how life goes, Ricky thought. You don't always get the things you want, thank you, Kit said. Thank you for that, hey, that's what friends are for, right? He told her, I guess so, Kit said. Yeah, so, look, here's the real question, if we are actually friends, as you say, does that mean you might teach me to surf? He asked her. Kit laughed. You don't know how. She really did like him. He was easy to be around, I'm not very good, Ricky said. Certainly not as good as you, nobody's as good as me, Kit said, and Ricky laughed. I know. So you gotta teach me, Kit smiled at him and hoped that one day she might meet a girl like Ricky. Someone kind. Someone who didn't have anything to prove. She had so much to prove. There wasn't any room for anyone else to prove much, all right, Kit said. I'll teach you. And then she leaned over, and she kissed Ricky on the cheekbone. It was the first time Kit had kissed someone with all of her heart, Tareen had been wrong. Brandon wasn't packing Nina's things. He had taken a bottle of Seagram's upstairs and sat down in the first open bedroom, one of the guest rooms. And now he was wallowing on the floor, this was the room he'd imagined would belong to his first child. Now, he was sitting in it, crying by himself, back against the nightstand, drinking whiskey out of the bottle, what the fuck is the matter with you, Brandon? Either one of those women would have made you happy, would have given you more than you ever deserved. How did you fuck that up, God, this was bad. He really didn't want to be left alone at the end of all this. He drank more of his whiskey and gagged at the sheer amount that was flowing down his throat. He wiped his mouth, he had to fix this. He had to get one of them back. He had to. And he could. He knew he could. All he had to do was convince one of them that he wasn't a shit. Which was easy enough because he really had not been that much of a shit until recently. Even the tabloids would tell you, he really was a good guy, he just needed to listen to his gut and choose the love of his life. And then he would get her back and be a good husband and have children and win more titles and have his life look just like it looked on the pages of the magazines. Just like it was supposed to, Brandon Randall was about to pass out but once he woke up. World, watch out. He was gonna go get one of those women back if it was the last thing he did. Jay was searching for HUD everywhere, he scanned the crowds in every room, pushing through people giving him dirty looks at being moved aside, smelling cigarette smoke and skunkweed, body odor and perfume. HUD was not in the front yard, downstairs, or upstairs. He was not in the backyard as far as Jay could see through the windows, Jay made it back to the bottom of the landing. He turned to a brunette woman in a polka dot dress smoking a joint. Have you seen HUD? Jay said, who's HUD? The woman asked, completely uninterested, Jay looked at her sideways. Who the fuck are you? He asked her, Heather, she said, smiling, well, Heather, HUD is my brother and he's fucking my girlfriend and I need to find him. Heather put out her hand, offering Jay the butt of her joint. You need this more than I do, no, thank you, are you sure? Jay frowned and took the joint from her. He put it to his lips and pulled in the smoke. He closed his eyes, let it permeate his lungs, sink into his body. He opened his eyes back up, do you feel better now? Heather asked him, Jay thought about it. No. Not at all, okay, Heather said, shrugging. Well, that's all I got. She turned away from him and resumed her conversation with the Laker girl she'd been talking to. Okay, but, like, Larry Bird is good though, Jay closed his eyes and pinched his nose, wondering why the fuck anyone would be defending the Celtics, but he didn't have time to fight her on it. He made his way to the backyard again, still trying to find HUD. 
He was still seething inside but his rage had nowhere to go. He tried to relax, tried to calm himself down. He didn't see HUD anywhere, now Vanessa was sitting in the lap of Kyle Mannheim, making out with him. Jesus, Vanessa. Jay made a note to himself to tell her she could do better than Kyle. But for now he simply tapped her on the shoulder, Vanessa turned and looked at him. Hey, she said. She seemed tipsy, but far from Blotto, have you seen Hud? Jay asked her. Vanessa shook her head. No. And you know what? I don't care that I haven't seen him. How's that? For once in my life, I can honestly say I just don't care, Jay had already stopped listening. His eye caught sight of the cliff's edge and the stairs to the beach. Yeah, cool, he walked, slowly and deliberately, making eye contact with no one until he got to the edge of the lawn, he looked down at the water, at the sand. On the beach, he saw two people in an embrace and he could instantly recognize the asshole he was looking for. Hud, Jay's rage turned red hot once again as he realized Ashley was there with him. This was fucking rich, Jay watched them start to make their way up the stairs to the backyard. He paced around. Talking himself up and down, unsure of what he would do when they reached the top, Mick pulled his car into the driveway of his daughter's house. He handed his keys over without even looking at the valet's face, he stood in the driveway, gazing up at the full scope of Nina's home, and fixed the knot of his tie, Mick was surprised by the sheer size of the house. Nina's husband must have bought it. Brandon something. The tennis player. He felt his hackles go up, are you? Eliza Nakamura said to Mick as he walked past her, toward the front door, Mick looked at her. She was good looking. If it had been the right time, he might have given her his signature smolder, lifted the edges of his famous lips to give her a grin. But Mick had learned nearly 25 years ago that his gravitational pull was such that he had to repel anyone he did not wish to actively attract, not now, he said to the young woman, Eliza turned away from him, annoyed, and moved on. She would tell people for the rest of her life that she'd met Mick Riva once and he was a dickhead. Mick did not care if people thought he was an asshole as long as they left him alone when he did not want them and flocked to him when he did. He ignored each and every person in the front yard who stared at him as he walked by them and headed straight over the threshold of his daughter's mansion, there was an audible gasp from one of the cocktail waitresses when she saw him. That made the two bartenders over by the record players look up toward the door and they both did double takes, seeing the bartenders out of the corner of his eye, Greg Robinson, still ripping it up, moved his eye to the door and saw a legend he once knew years before standing there. His hand slipped and the record scratched, then everyone in the living room looked up at the door, a house full of stars all staring at the biggest star in the room. The gasps and whispers started and within approximately 45 seconds of Mick placing his foot in the house, the entire party knew he was there, the entire party except for Casey Greens, who was hiding upstairs in the master bedroom, and Kit, who was with Ricky Esposito in her sister's outdoor shower, and Jay, who was outside looking for Hud, and Hud, who was down at the beach, and Nina, who had locked herself in the pantry, Hud spotted Jay out of the corner of his eye as he was making his way up the stairs with Ashley. The moment he saw him, his heart dropped. It was clear that Jay already knew what he'd resolved to tell him. Jay had the gait and the fury of a man recently made aware, Hud turned back to Ashley briefly as they came up the path. He looked at her with warning and apology, and in his glance she knew what he was trying to tell her. This is going to get worse before it gets better, Hud put his feet on the grass at the edge of the lawn and Ashley followed him and then stepped aside, out of the line of fire, Jay was in Hud's face in no time. You are a real piece of shit, Jay said. You know that? I know, Hud said. He did not ask how much Jay knew or how Jay knew. He understood those questions would only serve to make things worse, Jay shook his head, trying to speak but finding himself dumbfounded. What on earth could he possibly say that would come close to conveying his rage, Ashley and I are together, Hud said. 
Ashley watched his face as he spoke, stunned at the forthrightness of his words, the evenness of his voice. I fucked up in how I handled it. I lied to you and I went behind your back and I am sorry. But I love her, Hud caught Ashley's eye for a brief second. And she loves me, are you kidding me? Jay screamed, losing control of his voice as he continued to speak, its volume rising higher and higher with every second. That's your defense, Hud stepped closer to his brother and had a moment of sharp clarity. He would see this thing through, he would face every moment of it. And he would come out the other side with a brother and a wife and a child, I'm an asshole, Hud said. I admit it, that doesn't even begin to, no, it doesn't. You're right. But I need you to understand something. I'm not going to stop seeing her, Hud said. And I'm not going to let you stop speaking to me, a crowd had started to form and Jay was conscious of it, of the fact that every single person who became privy to this conversation was aware of his humiliation, so tell me what you need from me in order to put this behind us, what I need from you? Jay said. What I need from you is to stop sleeping with my ex-girlfriend, no, Hud said, shaking his head. My answer is no, when Jay lunged for Hud, it was not graceful. It was sloppy and scrappy and ugly. But it was effective. Before Hud even realized that his brother was aiming for him, his back was slammed down onto the lawn, Jay swung with reckless abandon but Hud did not fight back. Hud's upper arm strength alone could have crushed his brother's windpipe, shattered a rib. The lone joy of being the stocky one was that you were the stronger one. Jay on top of Hud, punching and elbowing and grabbing for whatever limbs he could, was like a whippet on a pit bull. But Hud would not further shame his brother, Jay and Hud had borne witness to the full scope of each other's lives. They had lived in the same rooms, wished on the same stars, breathed the same air, been taught and reared by the same mother and teachers. Been abandoned by the same father, they had traveled the same beaches, trespassed in the same oceans, surfed the same waves, stood on the same boards. Made love to the same woman, but they were not the same men. They were not haunted by the same demons, they were fighting for different things. Ashley screamed as Jay's fist made a crack against Hud's nose, Fuwuk, someone screamed from the crowd that had gathered. Others gasped as the blood started to trickle down, oh my god, one of the women said over and over. Someone do something, punch him again, a man called from the back, some people started cheering for Jay. Others yelled at Hud to fight back. Ashley wept. And the two brothers, aching and bruised and bleeding, continued on, Nina decided it was time to leave the pantry if only because the air was getting stale. But also because if this party wasn't going to end any time soon, she was at least going to try to enjoy it, all right, she said, standing up. Let's go join the land of the living. You do not have to, Tareen said, I want to, Nina said, holding her hand out for Tareen to lift herself up, I suppose I should check on Greg anyway, Tareen said, Nina opened the pantry door to see three girls standing by the breakfast nook, looking at her strangely. It's my pantry, she said. I can hide in it if I want to, she could hear a commotion out in the backyard but decided to ignore it. Instead, she walked toward the entryway and then stopped dead in place at what she saw, Dad? He was standing with his back to her but Nina recognized him instantly. His back was broad and sturdy and his shoulders were wide enough that, even with a jacket on, you could make out the perfect triangle they formed with his waist. His hair was grayer now, but the back of his head still looked exactly the way it had when she used to watch him watching television or running along the sand, she felt both intense familiarity and staggering strangeness as she looked at him, this man she knew so well, this man she barely knew at all. The combination made Nina feel dizzy, she pulled herself back behind the corner. What the fuck is my dad doing here? Nina asked. It was a rhetorical question, though she would have welcomed an answer. Your father? Tareen said, truly shocked, Tareen couldn't help but peek around the corner to see for herself. Wow, she said, stunned. Mick Riva. 
My God, Nina pulled her back. Why on earth would he be here, I assure you, I have no clue, Doreen said, peeking again, Nina searched for any reason that might explain it. Maybe he needs a kidney or something, Doreen looked at Nina to see if she was kidding. Nina was dead serious. I suppose that is possible, Doreen said, does he look sick? Tareen leaned over to get another look. Mick had turned around and Tareen could see his face. It was rugged and tan, all smiles. No, Tareen said. Actually, he looks quite handsome, Nina was surprised at the pride she took in this fact. Old? she asked, Tareen looked again. He looks just like he does in the magazines, this Nina found to be the most helpful piece of information. If her father looked like he did in the magazines, then, in some way, Nina did know her father. Even if it was barely more than most Americans. When she could hear her father's voice booming around the corner, Nina decided that she did not want to see him or talk to him or find out what he wanted. At least not at the moment, okay, Nina said. I don't have to deal with this right now if I don't want to, yes, that is exactly right, Tareen said. Nina spotted a plate of cheese on the kitchen counter. I'm going to eat this, she said. She threw a hunk of cheddar into her mouth. Hello, old friend. Then she set her sights on the brie, Nina breathed in deep and then picked up the entire tray of cheese, ready to carry it with her. She set out to alert her siblings that their father was there, like she was a surfer girl Paul Revere. Mick is coming she did not immediately spot her brothers or her sister. And so, her first stop would be upstairs, to talk to the only person at this party who had actually been looking for Mick Riva. 2 a.m., Vaughn Donovan walked in the front door already quite drunk. He was accompanied by an entourage that included his agent, his business manager, and four of his friends. As had become common for him, the women in the room all took note within a few minutes of his entrance. He threw an upward nod to say hi to a few of them, and then flashed his million-dollar smile. It felt good to be a movie star, back in high school in Dayton, Ohio, Robert Vaughn Donovan III did not make the football or the baseball team. But the moment he stepped into the school auditorium, he had found a home. With his quick wit and charmingly exasperated delivery of almost every line, he had the drama kids in stitches, his dad's college roommate was a Hollywood agent and by the time he was twenty. Robbie had booked his second audition, started going by Vaughn, and swiftly made a career of starring in movies as the cute and non-threatening boy next door who finally gets the girl, Vaughn was now twenty-five years old and a bona fide star. But, while he would never admit it to anyone, he still sometimes felt like he needed to sleep with as many beautiful women as possible, go to as many Hollywood parties as possible, make as many movies as possible, as if someone was going to hit a buzzer and send him back to Dayton at any moment. Vaughn rolled up the sleeves of his blazer and stepped farther into the foyer just as Nina rounded the corner and started up the stairs, whoa, he said as he saw her. The actual Nina Riva is here in front of me this very second. Everyone's dream girl, Vaughn, Nina said, holding the cheese plate with one hand and putting the other out to shake. Hi, he was even more handsome up close. His boyish blue eyes were bright and clear. His shaggy brown hair was perfectly contained under his pork pie hat. His jawline was sharp but his skin was soft and pristine. Most people, Nina knew, lost some of their luster when you met them in the flesh. But Vaughn Donovan was gorgeous, Vaughn took her hand and shook it. I'm a big fan of yours, he said. Big fan, why, thank you, Nina said, nodding. I loved your last movie. Wild Night. It was great, thanks, Vaughn said, smiling. We're thinking about doing a sequel. Maybe you can be in it, oh, that's so nice of you, Nina said. Um, listen, I have to run real quick, but I'll be back down soon and we should talk, Vaughn nodded. And then as Nina turned away, he grabbed her arm. He took his other hand and brushed the edge of her shirt, just at the top of her rib cage. 
This one isn't as soft to the touch as I was hoping, he said with a smile, then he winked at her, Nina stared at him. She cycled through two breaths. All right, Vaughn. I'll be seeing ya, she said and walked, briskly, up the stairs, just then, Vaughn's business manager came out from the kitchen with four beers. He punched a hole in the bottom of one of the cans with a pen and put it to Vaughn's mouth, Vaughn cheerily popped the tab and shotgunned it. When he was done, he threw the can on the floor and shook his head. Woot, he said. Let's get fucked up, a blonde waitress walked by with coke and Vaughn smiled at her and took a line. She batted her eyes at him, Bridger Miller came around the corner. Whoa, man. Bridger said, giving Vaughn a high five. They had not ever met before but fame is a secret club, everyone knows of one another, Bridger. Big fan. Man. Vaughn said. I saw you in Race Against Time. The scene where you scale that building was unreal, thanks, thanks, Bridger said, nodding. I didn't see your new one yet but my agent said it's funny as hell, Vaughn smiled, pleased. One day, maybe I'll do the action thing, Bridger laughed. Better than me trying to do comedy, I'll tell you that, one of Vaughn's friends, who happened to be standing by the china cabinet, said, hey, Vaughn. Weren't you saying earlier that you wanted to play frisbee? Before Vaughn could respond, his buddy took a plate out of the cabinet and flung it across the room to the opposite wall. It smashed into chunks and shards before its pieces even hit the floor, everyone turned to look at the cause of the commotion. But when Bridger chuckled, so did everyone else, fucking, a, man, Vaughn said, laughing. He strode over to the cabinet, picked a plate up himself, and threw it at the wall, Bridger grabbed two more and flung them in quick succession. The two high-fived, all right. Vaughn said, Bridger grabbed another plate. Everybody, let's do this, Nina walked into her bedroom and locked the door behind her, cheese, she said to Casey, offering her the tray, I'm good. Casey said. She felt sort of embarrassed to still be up there, in Nina's bedroom. Sorry, I didn't know where else to go, Casey added, by way of explanation, don't worry about it, Nina said. But, listen, Mick is downstairs, Casey looked shocked. If Nina had wondered whether Mick being here had anything to do with Casey, the expression on Casey's face cleared it up, what do you mean Mick's here? Like right now? Casey said, yeah, Nina said as she walked into her closet. She kept the door open so she could continue to talk. There, she took off her gauzy shirt and her tight skirt and her oxygen-depriving tights and her torturous high heels. She stood in a bra and thong and then took both of those off. 2. She grabbed a pair of white cotton underwear and pulled them up her legs and then put on a jock bra. She put on a pair of heather gray sweatpants, elastic at both the waist and the ankles and a faded neon blue t-shirt that said O'Neill across the chest, men were bullshit, people were bullshit, and Nina was not going to live through bullshit while wearing high heels a single second longer. I don't know why he's here, Nina said. But he's here, Casey felt a rush of anxiety. She wasn't even sure she wanted to meet Mick Riva yet, let alone figure out what to say to him, Nina threw herself onto her bed and lay on her back, staring at the ceiling. I suppose you could go downstairs right now and ask him if he's your dad, Nina said. But even as she said it, she felt a twinge. It bothered Nina, the idea that Casey might manage to have more of a direct relationship with Mick than she did, that Casey might be unafraid to do the very thing Nina was avoiding. Saying hello, Nina watched as Casey sat down on the bed next to her. What is he like? Casey asked. Nina continued to stare up at the ceiling and answered as best she could. I think he's an asshole. But I can't be sure. I don't actually know him well enough to say, Casey watched as Nina continued to stare at the ceiling and breathe deeply, her chest rising high and falling, he sounds like a real winner, Casey said as she lay down on her back next to Nina, staring up at the ceiling, too, Nina turned to Casey. Listen, I'm not sure, I mean, 
if you're looking for family, there might be better ones to pick, Casey turned to Nina and smiled gently. That's not exactly how family works, is it? No, Nina said, shaking her head. No, I guess it's not, Mick reached the sliding glass door to the lawn and looked out at the crowd. He could tell someone was beating the shit out of someone else. But it wasn't until he made his way to the edge of the circle that had formed around them that he suspected it might be his sons, as he looked at the two men grappling on the ground, he had to admit an ugly truth to himself, it was not so easy to recognize your own children after twenty years away, he knew Jay from the magazines, much the same way he knew Nina. He wasn't 100% sure that the one on the ground was HUD. But, Mick reasoned, you probably don't go to these lengths to beat the shit out of someone unless they are close enough to have really gotten under your skin. So he made an educated guess, as for his youngest, he would not have recognized her if she were standing right next to him, which she was, Kit had left Ricky behind when she heard her brothers yelling and made her way to the front of the crowd. She was stunned to see that not only was Jay pummeling Hud, but that her father was standing there watching him do it, she stood, frozen, next to him. Her eyes were wide, her fingers were stiff as her pinky grazed the arm of his jacket. She could not believe she was in the presence of this larger-than-life figure who had hovered over her her entire life. And yet had been so long out of reach. There he was. She could extend her pinky just, one half a centimeter, farther, and, touch him, and then in an instant, he was gone, lunging forward and pulling his older son off his younger one. It wasn't difficult for Mick to get hold of Jay, Jay's body was all limbs, easy to grab and throw down onto his back, Hud put his hands to his nose as Ashley ran toward him. He looked up to see who had stopped the fight, Jay got a hold of himself and looked up to see who had pulled him off, Dad, the two of them said at the same time, with the same inflection, Kit found this sort of preposterous. Dad, some of the crowd began to disperse now that the fight was over. But a lot of people stuck around. Shamelessly gawking at Mick Riva, in the flesh, will you sign this napkin? Kyle Mannheim asked, the second he could get close enough. He handed Mick a pen he'd scrounged up from some girl's purse, Mick rolled his eyes and scribbled across the cocktail napkin and handed it back. A line had started to form. Mick shook his head. No, no, that's it, no more autographs. Everyone groaned, acting as if they had been denied a basic human right, but still, they began to wander off. All right, get up, you too, Mick said, offering an arm to each of his sons. This, too, mystified Kit as she watched, that he could offer a boost now, having offered so little for so long, Hud and Jay each took the arm he offered and pulled themselves onto their feet, Hud took a quick catalogue of his injuries, he was pretty sure his nose was broken and could feel he had a black eye, a nicked eyebrow, and a sliced lip. His ribs were bruised, his legs were sore, his abdomen tender. When he tried to breathe deeply, he almost collapsed, Jay had a gash on his chin, a bruised tailbone, and a shattered ego, Ashley moved closer to Hud, as if to try to take care of him. But as she took a step in his direction, she saw him flinch. And she understood that her presence, at least right now, could only make things worse, she turned from him and Hud breathed her name. But she kept walking, pushing through the onlookers, she wanted a place to cry alone. As she made her way into the kitchen, she considered going out to her car. But it would take forever for the valets to extract it from the maze of vehicles they had parked on the front lawn. Instead, she cut in line to the bathroom, sat down on the toilet lid, and bawled her eyes out, What are you doing here? Jay asked his father. His chin stung as the air hit the fresh cut and he wondered just how bad Hud was feeling, I got an invitation, Mick said, there are no invitations. Hud said. And even if there were. He didn't finish the sentence. He couldn't. He didn't know the man in front of him well enough to insult him to his face, well, I got one, Mick said. But who cares about that? Why are you two beating the life out of each other? It's not. It's not any of your business. It's a... 
Jay found himself at a staggering loss for words. He looked over at his brother, Hud looked back at him, bloodied and purple and hunched over, trying hard not to breathe too deeply, but clearly just as confused. And in Hud's confusion, Jay found solace. He was not crazy. This was, in fact, beyond comprehension, you can't just walk in here and start asking questions like that, Kit said. Mick, Jay, and Hud all turned at the sound of her voice. Her stance was wide, her shoulders were squared, her face showed neither awe nor shock, who are you? Mick said, but then the moment it came out of his mouth he knew the answer. I mean, I, I'm your daughter. Kit said with a tone of amusement. It did not surprise her, his not knowing. But she found herself desperate to hide how much it still stung, I know that, Catherine, he said. I'm sorry. You grew up even more beautiful than I envisioned. He smiled at her in a way that she assumed was supposed to convey some sort of charming embarrassment. And in that smile, Kit saw the magnetism her father wielded. Even when he failed, he won, didn't he? We call her Kit, Jay said, her name is Kit, Hud added, Kit, Mick said, directing his attention back to her and putting his hand on her shoulder. It suits you. Kit moved away from her father's hand and laughed. You have no idea what suits me, I was the first person to hold you the day you were born. Mick said to her gently. I know you like I know my own soul, Kit found his intensity, his presumed connection with her, unsettling. I'm the one who has invited you to this party for the past four years, she said, Hud looked at Jay and said, under his breath, did you know that? Jay shook his head. Why are you only here now? Kit asked, Kit had looked forward to writing that invitation every year. She felt powerful doing it, as if she was both brazen and valiant. She was daring him to show up. Daring him to show his face around here. She felt vindicated every time he didn't, every year he ignored that invitation, it renewed her indignation. It was one more good reason to dislike the motherfucker. It was one more reason not to bother worrying if he was okay or if he missed them. It was one more reason she wouldn't have to show up at his funeral. And it felt good, but him here, now. This wasn't how it was all supposed to go, I want to see if we can, be a part of one another's lives, he said. I've missed you all so much. He looked directly at Kit as he spoke, and his eyes misted, and his mouth turned down. For a split second, Kit's chest ached, imagining a world of pain that her father might have lived in without them. Did it hurt him? To be away? Did he think of them? Did he feel their absence every day? Had he picked up the phone a hundred times but never dialed, but then Kit remembered that her father had taken a stab at acting back in the late sixties. He'd been nominated for a Golden Globe, that's how good he was, no, Kit said shaking her head. Listen, I'm sorry, she said, sincerely. I know that I invited you. It was my mistake. I think that you should go, Mick frowned but remained undeterred. How about this, he said. Let's all go someplace quiet and talk, he could see that Kit was about to reject this plan and he put his hands up in surrender. And then, I'll go. But despite everything we've been through, you are my children. So, please, let's just talk for a moment. Maybe down by the beach, away from the party. That's all I'm asking. You all have a few minutes for your old man, don't you? Kit looked to Jay, Jay looked to Hud, Hud looked at Kit, and then the three of them took the stairs down to the beach with their father. Casey was telling Nina the story of the time she got stuck on a Ferris wheel with her first boyfriend when Nina heard people in the hallway saying Mick Riva had broken up a fight in the backyard, did you hear that? Nina said to Casey, hear what? Casey asked, it sounded like someone said dad broke up a fight outside, Nina got up and walked to the window and Casey followed, Casey had never experienced that, the use of dad as opposed to my dad. There had been only herself growing up, no one to compare notes with, share parents with. And then here Nina was, sharing the word with her, 
Nina stood at the window and looked down at her yard. The pool was half empty, all of the people who'd been splashing in it had transferred much of the water onto her yard. There were plastic cups all over the place. Huge areas of her lawn were covered in broken porcelain. Blue and white chargers and dinner plates and teacups and saucers were all in pieces around her palm trees. Nina thought it was sort of fitting that her wedding china had been destroyed, I never liked that china, she told Casey. Brandon's mother insisted that I had to pick out something floral but I think having fine china is sort of silly. And anyway, I wanted the bird pattern, why didn't you get the birds, then? Casey asked, Nina looked at her and frowned. I. She began to say, but then changed the subject. Do you smoke? she said, pulling out a pack of cigarettes from her nightstand drawer. She offered one to Casey. Oh, no but, uh, okay, Casey said. She took the unlit cigarette from Nina's hand and put it to her mouth, Nina lit it and then lit her own, Casey took a drag and coughed. You were saying. She said once she caught her breath. About the birds. Why didn't you get them, Nina looked at Casey and then out the window, considering the question. The crowd was starting to shift, and as it did, Nina saw something startling. Her brothers, her sister, and her father, all together, walking down the stairs to the beach, because I'm a doormat, Nina said. I'm a human doormat. She put her cigarette out. Fuck it. You stay here. I'm gonna go talk to Mick Riva. Three a.m. Ted Travis was hell bent on self-destruction. He was the biggest, highest-paid star on network TV, but none of that had mattered to him since his wife died last year. He felt like he was falling apart inside, sobbing alone in his huge house, hiring hookers, shoplifting, upgrading from the occasional coke binge to a full-blown speed addiction but all of the chaos of his soul wasn't showing on the outside, when he looked in the mirror, he could see he was just getting handsomer and handsomer. Turns out, he looked even better with gray hair than he had with brown. Sometimes, when he looked at his own reflection, he could hear the ghost of Willa's voice in his head, laughing, telling him he had no right to age so well without her. Drinking quieted it, at Nina's party, Ted had already downed half a bottle of whiskey, lost four grand on a bet to that girl from Flashdance, and then fallen asleep fully clothed in the shallow end of the pool. Someone had cannonballed into the water and woken him up. He climbed out, but then, her, a 43-year-old script supervisor named Victoria Brooks, he came across her in the living room when his clothes had just stopped dripping. She was tall and lean and didn't have a single curve on her body. She had bleached blonde hair and dark eyebrows and a face that was positively breathtaking in profile, Ted, he said, putting out his hand as he walked up to her, Vicky rolled her eyes. Yeah, I know who you are. And you are, Vicky, beautiful name. Let me get you a drink, Ted said as he gave her his TV smile, Vicky blew her cigarette away from both of them, her left hand pinning a highball of vodka and soda against her right arm. I have one, thanks, what do I have to do to get a smile out of you, he asked her, Vicky rolled her eyes again. Sober up, maybe. You've embarrassed yourself about ten times already tonight, Ted laughed. You're right about that. I keep trying to find a way to enjoy myself. But it's pointless. I'm too goddamn sad all the time, Vicky finally looked Ted in the eye, she was sad, too. God, she was sad. Her husband had died in a boating accident seven years ago and she had resigned herself to loneliness since then. She was not willing to love again, if this was how it felt, one drink, Vicky said, surprising herself, Ted smiled. He got her a fresh vodka soda, straightened his damp clothes, and went back to her, I want to take you out, he said. So what should I do to convince you? Are you a grand gesture sort of lady, Vicky sighed. I guess so. But I'm not going on a date with you, Ted smiled exactly the way he did on cool nights. He was just going through the motions, but he was good at pretending. 
That's why they paid him so much money to do it. Come on, I might just charm you. Watch this. He started looking around for the easiest way to make a scene. He settled on swinging from the chandelier, Ted handed Vicky his drink and started climbing onto the mantel. He pointed at a surfer by the coffee table. Hey, man, pass me the chandelier, would you? The guy, content to play along, stood on top of the coffee table and grabbed the base of the chandelier, slowly moving it toward Ted. Ted grabbed a handful of the crystals on the bottom, Vicky, let me take you to dinner, he said. And then he swung himself across the room, hanging on for dear life. He hit the opposite wall and then let go, crashing onto the sofa with the howl of an injured animal. Vicky found herself running to him, are you okay, she said. Come on, get up. She put her arms around Ted to help him, the warmth of her hands made him feel, for one half second, no longer alone. Instead of standing up with her, he pulled her down to him. Can I kiss you, he said and when she smiled, he did it. She felt his soft lips on hers and she did not balk. A thrill ran through her like a bolt. She pulled back, speechless. And then, drunk and confused and momentarily desperate for the very thing she thought she'd never want again, she kissed him once more. It may have looked absurd from the outside, but it felt sort of magical to the two of them. The surprise of sincere desire, the people around them cheered as another idiot decided to try to swing from the chandelier, but Ted was already planning his next escapade. Have you ever stolen something, Vicky? he asked, as his eyebrows went up and a smile crept over his face, Ashley wiped her eyes, pulled herself together, and walked out of the bathroom. She stepped over broken glass and crushed pita, hummus smeared across the tiles of the floor. She went out to the front stoop and gave her ticket to the valet. For some reason, she felt strongly that the baby was a boy. And she liked the name Benjamin. If it did turn out to be a girl, maybe something like Lauren, the rest of it, who knew? Jay would forgive Hud or he wouldn't. Hud would come back to her, or he wouldn't. They would be a family, or they wouldn't. This would all work out, or it wouldn't. But there would be a Benjamin or a Lauren. She and her Benjamin or her Lauren, they'd be okay, the valet brought Ashley her car and she got in and drove away, as she pulled out onto PCH, Hungry Heart started playing through her speakers and Ashley felt just the tiniest bit of hope. Your whole world can be falling apart, she thought, but then Springsteen will start playing on the radio. Ricky Esposito was back hanging out near the food, eating plain crackers since the cheese plate was gone. He was trying to decide if he should just leave. He'd struck out with the girl of his dreams and he wasn't yet in, the mood to set his sights on another, Vanessa de la Cruz walked into the kitchen, oh, I'm starved, she said, grabbing a cracker. Who took all the cheese? Her hair was a mess, her eye makeup was smudged. Ricky had seen her around with Kit before. There was something so quirky about her, fun night? Ricky asked, Vanessa nodded. Greatest night of my fucking life, she said, Ricky laughed, I'm serious, Vanessa said, eating a cracker. I spent so much time thinking I was in love with one guy. One guy. And I just decided to get over it and it was like the whole world opened up. I made out with five dudes tonight. Five. They will tell legends about me one day, Ricky laughed again, none were a love match, unfortunately, she said. But, you know, I have to be patient. Rome wasn't built in a day, Ricky laughed once more, she was funny. No, I guess not, Vanessa looked at him, actually looked at him, for the first time since they'd started talking. You're the one. Kit's guy. Vanessa said suddenly. Did she kiss you? Ricky nodded. But I don't think she saw fireworks, Vanessa bent her head to the side, surprised and disappointed. Really? She seemed into you, Ricky smiled and shook his head. She's definitely not into me, Vanessa considered him. She should be. You're cute, oh, well, thank you, Ricky said, unconvinced, 
no, I'm serious. I didn't see it before, because you dress like a middle schooler, thank you, I just mean, you know, you could dress cooler, Ricky looked at his t-shirt and khakis. I guess so, you're sure Kit's not into you, I'm positive. She said all we will ever be is friends, Vanessa cocked her head to the side again. I'm sorry. Those Rivas will break your heart, Ricky took a sip of the beer he'd been nursing. I'll be all right, Vanessa nodded. I can tell you from experience that you definitely will. Good God, Nina actually lives on the edge of a cliff, Mick said, as he moved down the stairs, yeah, Jay said. It's a pretty great location. Sick waves, sick waves? Mick asked. Oh, right. Yeah. I bet, Mick didn't surf. He didn't get the appeal. It seemed like an odd way to spend your life, riding a piece of wood in the ocean. It certainly didn't seem like a thing to bank your fortune on the way it seemed his children had. Had none of them considered that talent like Mix might be hereditary? Surely one of them must have a voice. He would have been happy to help them break into the industry, in one phone call, he could set them up with a career most people would kill for, could set them up for life. He could give his children things that most people only dream of, he had not been perfect as a father, that much was obvious. But if the goal for any generation is to do better than the one before them, then Mick had succeeded. He had given his children more than he had ever been given. He reminded himself of this as his feet hit the sand. He was not so bad, he moved out of the way, letting Kit and Hud and Jay all join him on the shoreline. He kicked off his shoes, pulled off his socks, cuffed his pants. It had been a long time since he had been on the beach at night. Being on the beach at night was for young romantics and troublemakers, Mick felt perfectly fine no longer being young. He liked the gravitas of age. Liked the respect it afforded him. And if getting on in years was supposed to make you afraid of dying, he wasn't doing it right. The prospect of death didn't bother him at all. He had no plans to bribe the Grim Reaper, in fact, in some perverse sort of way, Mick was quite looking forward to the aftermath of his passing. He knew the nation would mourn him. He would be called a legend. Decades later people would still know his name. He had achieved that rare level of fame that allows a person to transcend mortality. What Mick was afraid of was becoming irrelevant. He found himself paralyzed by the thought that the world might pass him by while he was still in it, all right, Mick, we're here. What do you want to say? Kit said. She glanced at her brothers, who would not look at each other. Kit wanted to know why Jay had beaten the shit out of HUD, but at the moment, there were more important things, you can call me dad, you know, Mick said to her, I can't, actually, but let's move on, Kit said, HUD in grave pain and wishing he had access to Percocet and maybe a couple of stitches, found himself unsure what to say, or whether he was even physically capable of saying it. And so, he kept quiet, I know we haven't been close. Mick started. But I'd like for us all to get to know each other a little bit, Kit rolled her eyes, but Jay was listening. He sat down on the cold sand of the beach and crossed his legs. Mick put his hands down on the sand and sat, too. Hud didn't think he could sit without his ribs, causing agonizing pain. Kit just refused, go ahead, Jay said, shouldn't someone find Nina? Hud asked, Mick guessed that Nina would be the hardest to win over. He figured it would be easier to divide and conquer, so he plunged ahead. Listen to me, kids, he said. I know I wasn't as available as I should have been but, you weren't available at all, Kit reminded him, Mick nodded. You are right. I wasn't there for you during things that no child should have to live through. This was the first time Mick had acknowledged the loss of their mother, and both Hud and Kit found it hard to look him directly in the eye as he said it. The two of them still held pockets of grief in their bodies that bubbled up at inopportune moments. Kit particularly, grieve the way some people drink, which is to say, rarely but always alone and to excess. 
So she could not keep Mick's gaze at that very moment because she did not want to cry. But Hud found the easiest way through pain is, in fact, through it. And he let the tears fall when they came. When he thought of his mother and the despair he'd felt in those months after she was gone, those months where they waited for their father to attempt any kind of rescue, Hud could do nothing but feel it. And so he turned away for the exact opposite reason his sister did. He turned away so no one would see him tear up. And then he wiped his eyes and turned back, Jay wasn't looking away at all. He was listening, intently, hoping his father had something to say that might make anything better. Anything at all, I've made mistakes, Mick said. And I can, I can try to explain them, and I can tell you my own problems. About the screwed up way I was raised. But none of that matters. What matters is that I'm here now. I'd like to be a proper family. I want to make things right, Mick had envisioned the possibility that upon his saying this, one of them might run into his arms and hug him tight. He had an image in his head that this would be the beginning of Sunday dinners together when he was in town, or maybe celebrating Christmas at his place in Holmby Hills, but none of his children appeared to have budged very much yet. And so he pushed forward. I'd like us to start over. I want to try again, Hud was struck by Mick's word choice. Try, can I ask a serious question? Kit asked. I'm not trying to cause trouble. I just genuinely don't understand something. Okay, Mick said. He had stood up and was now resting against the rocks of the cliff, are you an AA? Is this part of your twelve steps or something, she asked. She could not quite imagine what had prompted all of this. But it might make sense to her if it was in service of something else. If he was here to make himself feel better, to tie up loose ends or something. That she could understand. I mean, why now? You know? Why not yesterday or last year or six months ago or how about when our mother fucking died, Kit, Hud said. Don't talk like that, but our mother did die. Kit said. And he left us to fend for ourselves, Kit. Jay said. You asked him a question, let him answer it, Mick shook his head. No, he said. I'm not in any kind of program that requires me to make amends, then what are you after? Kit asked, I'm not after anything, Mick said, defensively. Why is that so hard to believe? Why don't my own children understand that I just want us to be a part of each other's lives, Jay spoke up. That's not what we're saying, duh, Hud cut him off. Kit's just asking what's changed. Actually, I want to know, too. So I guess we're asking, he said, his voice becoming softer and yet more focused, what's changed, before Mick could answer, Nina's feet hit the sand, she hadn't heard Mick's apology or his appeals but she could guess what they entailed. She'd overheard the same things as a child. His talk of having lost his way and owning up to his mistakes and asking for another chance. She didn't need to see the live show, she'd seen in it previews, I'll tell you what's changed for him. Nothing, Nina said, they all turned toward her. None of them were surprised to see her. They all had more or less hoped she'd find them here but they were a little taken aback by her sweatpants and her general demeanor. What Nina was this, nothing has changed, right, dad? Nina said, looking right at him, hi, Nina baby, Mick said, walking to her, this was his first time seeing her up close as an adult. And he was overcome by the affection he felt for her face, he saw himself in it, in the lips and the cheekbones and the tanned skin. But he saw June in it, too. He could see her in Nina's eyes and her brows and nose, he missed June. He missed her so much. He missed her roast chicken and the way she had always smiled when he walked in the door. He missed the smell of her. The way she loved to love the people around her. Her death had shocked him. He'd always imagined that he could one day come home to her. If she was still alive, he'd be with her right now. He'd have come to her tonight, maybe even sooner, to look at Nina, as Mick did now, was to have proof that June had lived, 
He moved closer to Nina, ready to hug her. But she put her hands up, stopping him. You're fine where you are, she said, Nina, Mick said, aggrieved, Nina ignored him. Guys, if you want to know why he's here, it's really simple, she said to her siblings. Then, she redirected her attention to her father. You're here because you want to be, right? She asked him. Because you woke up this morning and you got a wild hair up your ass to try to be a decent guy. Mick flinched. That is absolutely not, hold up, she said. I'm not done. She continued, her voice strong and rising. It's awfully convenient that you're suddenly interested in us once we're all adults, once we no longer need anything from you. I told you that's not, I said I wasn't done, Nina, I am your, you are fucking nothing. Kit's mouth dropped and Jay's and Hud's eyes went wide. The three of them watched their father's face as he moved through stages of shock. The air carried only the sounds of the crashing waves in front of them and the light cacophony of the party above, Nina spoke again. You are a big somebody to the world, Dad. We all know that. We live with it every goddamn day. But let's be clear about one thing, you are not anybody's father, Kit looked at Nina, trying to catch her eye. But Nina would not break her gaze. She stared only at Mick, it would not be her that bent and broke anymore. Casey left the bedroom and started walking down the stairs. She was restless and didn't know what to do with herself, she walked past a couple making out so aggressively that she couldn't be sure they weren't having sex. But she was almost positive both of them were anchors on the nightly news and she resolved to never watch Channel 4 again, when she got to the living room, she saw a group of people swinging from the chandelier like they were swashbucklers. Just as two people grabbed on and let it fly, the entire thing came off the ceiling, plaster and crystal covering the floor and the table and the heads of everyone underneath it, there was a hole where the chandelier had been, exposing the inner frame of the house. Casey reversed course. As she started to move through the dining room on her way to the kitchen, she noticed a vase had been shattered and two paintings had fallen off the wall. When she finally made her way into the kitchen, she saw the floor was covered in tiny shards of chips and crackers that had been crushed under dancing feet. Empty wine bottles were rolling around on the ground. Two grown men sat on the island countertop, washing their feet in the sink, my editor says he thinks my manuscript could be the defining novel of the MTV generation, one of them said, as the two of them hopped off the counter and left the room, Casey got to work. She stood next to the stove, stacking empty trays, using a sponge to wipe up crumbs. Her mother had always tidied the house when she felt out of sorts. She remembered that her father had known to ask her mother what was wrong when he found her cleaning the drum of the washing machine. The world may have taken her parents but, as cruel as it was, at least it had left her the memory of them. It did not rob her of the ability to remember Memorial Day in 1980 at Dodger Stadium, when her father spilled mustard on his shirt and then laughed and squirted some on hers so he wouldn't be the only one. It had not stolen the scent of wind song that her mother used to wear or how their home always smelled like pine soul. It could not take away her father's many pairs of reading glasses, left all over the house, collecting, disappearing, and reproducing, Casey knew that, in a few years, the memories would begin to fade. She might forget whether her father had spilled mustard or ketchup. She might lose the ability to recall the exact smell of wind song. She might even forget about the reading glasses altogether after a while, as much as it pained her to admit it, she knew that she could not sustain her life fueled only by the memories of those she once loved. Loss would not propel her forward. She had to go out and live. She had to find new people, she tried to imagine her parents doing what she was doing right now, crashing a famous party in Malibu. She could not even picture it. But she understood that while the circumstances were almost unrecognizable, she did still have the instincts they'd given her. After all, when they could not have a child, they went out in search of one. They had taught her that family is found, that whether it be blood or circumstance or choice, what binds us does not matter. All that matters is that we are bound, and that was why Casey was there. In search of family, 
just as her parents once had been, Casey slowly put down the sponge, turned from the counter, and walked outside, she was going to walk down those terrifying steps. The ones that appeared to lead to the very edge of the earth, Brandon Randall woke up and realized he had passed out on the guest bedroom floor. He looked at his watch. It was half past three in the morning. He stood up, a little dizzy, and remembered he had to win back the love of his life, he put his shoes back on. He fixed his hair. And then he walked downstairs and out the front door to where all of the vehicles were parked, I need my car, he said to the valet. Sir, the valet said. You don't seem like you should be driving, just get me my car, Brandon said. The silver Mercedes, up there at the front, Brandon had been the first one to arrive and so his car was packed in, quite firmly, behind at least a hundred others, it's going to take a while, the valet warned, the key stand was left unmanned as the valet began the job of getting Brandon's car out. The other valets were busy with other people. Brandon stood alone, lost in his own impaired thoughts, and started to forget why he was waiting there, what had he been hanging around for? Oh, right. A car, fuck it. Brandon helped himself to a set of keys he saw with a Jaguar key chain and then used them to unlock the black Jag right in front of him. And without delay, Brandon Randall drove off in Mick Riva's car to go profess his love to Carrie Soto, Tareen was sitting on Greg's lap and nuzzling his neck while he continued to kick out the jams. But as she turned her head away, she saw the unmistakable sight of Von Donovan taking the Liechtenstein off the wall and then, peeing on it, she started to wonder if maybe this party was getting out of control, Mick was taken aback by his daughter's anger but he was not deterred, you're right, he said, looking at his firstborn. I have not been a father, to you all. I have not been here when I should have been, Nina looked away, toward the water. Mick turned to the rest of his kids and switched tactics. How about this? I won't ask for your forgiveness or ask you to make any promises. I'm just asking to get to know you all, a little bit, they all turned to one another and then to Nina. Did they owe him that much? Nina wasn't sure. Maybe you owe your parents nothing, maybe you owe them everything. But she was overwhelmed by her certainty that if her mother were in her place, she would give him a chance. Okay, fine, Nina said. And then she turned to her shed, opened the lock, pulled out an array of towels, and threw down a couple of surfboards. They hit the ground with a muffled thud, Nina sat down on a surfboard, her feet on the sand, her elbows perched over her knees. Everyone else followed suit, the five of them sat like that, on Nina's longboards, and let the fresh air surrounding them grow stale with their silence, quite a beating you took there, son, Mick said finally, unsure where to start. He figured he'd address the elephant in the room, Hud nodded, felt his lip. The blood was dry, flex, crumpled off. Yeah, he said, not looking directly at his attacker. I guess, what happened here? Mick said. It's not really anyone's business, is it? Jay said, I don't know, Kit said. I'm pretty interested, Mick looked to Kit and saw, for the first time, what his daughter looked like when she smiled. She looked just like him, that crinkle in her eye was so familiar. And yet, what an enigma she was. The youngest, the newest, the one he did not know. She was so boyish, in a way that Mick wasn't sure was a good thing. But she looked like trouble, and that drew Mick in, what has she inherited from me? He wondered. He suspected it was boldness, a sense of entitlement to say whatever she wanted. How had he given it to her so passively? And yet, there it was, he hadn't even needed to be there in order to help form his children. This does seem like something we should talk about, Nina said, gesturing to Hud's eyes and the way he was cradling his ribs. Are you okay? Do you need a doctor, I'm not sure, Hud said. I mean, no. Not yet at least. He was trying not to cause any alarm. He knew that right now what he needed to do was play it cool. He was worried about Ashley, about where she was, about how she was feeling. He needed to take care of her, and he would, but for now, he knew she would be okay. 
She was the kind of woman who was always going to be okay. It was half of why he loved her, seriously though, Kit pushed. What happened, Hud looked to Jay, he's sleeping with Ashley, Jay said, his voice flat, Kit gasped, who is Ashley? Mick said, Jay's ex-girlfriend, Kit offered up. Who dumped him, she didn't dump me, all right, look, I handled it all wrong, Hud admitted, there was no right way to handle it, Jay said as he turned to him. You just shouldn't have done it, seems like a fair point, Mick said. Women shouldn't come between brothers, Hud rolled his eyes at his father passing judgment on anything. But it was Jay who spoke up, seething with rage. Shut up, Dad. You have absolutely no idea what you're talking about, I was agreeing with why. I don't care. Hud can fuck all my ex-girlfriends ten times in front of me and I'd still like him more than I like you, Mick felt a pinch in his chest, Hud and Ashley, huh? Kit said. Sometimes, she just couldn't stop herself from poking at things to see if they twitched. I don't quite see it. She seems a little, I don't know, boring, would you quit it, Kit? Hud snapped. You have no idea what you're talking about. She's not boring, she's shy. She's sweet and thoughtful and funny. So, shut up. Hud wasn't going to bring up the fact that she was also the mother of his child. He needed to wait until that would be received as a good thing. He needed that news to make people happy, not furious. I love her. I am in love with her, Jay turned to his brother, finally listening to what Hud had been trying to tell him all night. He loved her. Jay had never loved Ashley. Not even close. How long have you two been, Jay wasn't quite sure of the word he wanted to use, going around behind my back. Hud looked at the sand, stared at how his toes got lost beneath it. A long time, he said, Mick watched his sons. He himself had punched little shits that so much as looked at one of his dates. He'd also screwed almost all of his friends' wives, the two of them seem pretty serious, Nina chimed in. Doesn't seem like something Hud just did on a whim, you knew? Jay said, his blood starting to boil again, Nina shook her head. No, but I saw them in the yard a few hours ago, you should have told me, Jay said, Jay, it's not her fault, Hud said, shut up, Hud, Jay added, seriously? You're arguing over Ashley? Kit asked, shut up, Kit, both Hud and Jay said, sorry, Kit said. I'm just saying that of all things for the two of you to get in a fight over. I'm surprised it's some girl, she's not just some girl, Hud said, exasperated. That's what I'm trying to say. I want to marry her, to Mick, this seemed like the mad ravings of a pussy whipped twenty something. Hud, you're twenty. Mick paused, realizing he didn't know exactly how old his son was, I'm 23, Hud said, right, Mick said. That's what I was going to say, you don't know how old he is. You don't know how old any of us are, Kit said. Just admit it. You don't need to pretend so much, I'm not pretending. They are 23, Mick said. I knew that, Jay corrected him. I turned 24 two weeks ago right, Mick said. His shoulders slumped. Sorry. I forgot you two aren't actually twins. Kit shook her head. You are ridiculous. But at least now you're telling the truth, she said. How do you ration it out? You get four honest moments a day, Mick laughed, despite himself. Yeah, but I try to keep a couple in the reserve, he said, grinning out of the side of his mouth. The sound that came out of Kit's mouth was somewhere between a scoff and a laugh. Mick locked eyes with her and could tell she was almost about to smile. What do you want me to say, all right? We all know I'm a shit. It's not news. I've been a shit my whole life, Kit looked him in the eye now. He knew she was finally, actually listening. I wish I was a better man, he said. But I was just never capable of it. I really did try, sometimes. But it was like putting lipstick on a pig. Some people are just shits, 
and I'm a shit, HUD found it hard to be mad at someone who was suddenly being so transparent. Jay found it refreshing, the idea that it was okay to admit you suspected yourself of being a dickhead, deep inside. Nina had to stop herself from rolling her eyes, honestly, it never quite made sense why a woman as good as your mother picked me, but, you know. I did lay it on pretty thick when I met her, he said. The second I saw her, with her big brown eyes, I thought, let me just try to be whoever she wants. Let me just pretend I can be good enough for her. And I really did become that person for a little while there. I know I failed at the end but, I did try, Nina turned and looked at her father. Mick caught her eye and relaxed into the softness of her gaze. She deserved better, he said softly. I hope she knew that, Nina watched her father's face. She watched his long eyelashes as he blinked, remembering looking at them as a child, she didn't, Nina said, her voice almost as quiet as breath. She didn't know that, Mick nodded, his eyes to the ground. I know, he said. I know, Nina watched as his eyes turned glassy, as the corners of his mouth turned down. She began to understand something she had never suspected. He was sorry. For what he'd done to all of them, Nina started to open her mouth, to say something, when she heard a rustling from behind her, everyone turned their heads to see a girl in a purple dress coming down the stairs. For a.m., Tareen Montefiore was, for a brief moment in the chaos of the night, looking at her paramour, and wondering if she wanted to spend her life with him. He had, just earlier that day, asked her to marry him, she had always liked older men and always liked spending her time with people who knew more than she did. She figured it came down to the fact that her father had been such a brilliant man. Tareen's father was a linguistics professor who brought his whole family on his journeys, teaching in universities on three continents. And, through David Montefiore, Tareen had come to learn about the world. She felt she understood so much about life and culture that no man her own age could keep up with her. Also, her father was twenty years older than her mother, so she liked that Greg's skin was a bit rougher, that it hung differently on his body. She liked the taste of decades of cigarettes on his tongue, the creeping gray in his hair. She liked that when he put his hands on her ass, she knew that he could feel its relative youth, so maybe, Tareen reasoned, there was a future here, Tareen would retire from modeling soon. She would plan their wedding, plan their honeymoon. Maybe they could travel the world for a while, then settle down in a Santa Barbara Spanish-style home in Beverly Hills. They would have no children, about this Tareen was adamant. And then, soon enough after their wedding, she would get back to work. She needed a second act, she had already had an offer for her own daytime talk show. She thought that could be a great next step. She was also considering designing a line of aerobics wear. There were a lot of things that might be interesting, Tareen knew that Greg would be a good partner in all of this, in anything she decided to do. He would be behind her, he would believe in her and support her. They would have so much fun together, every day of their lives, as she thought of it, a smile spread across Tareen's face. She leaned over to Greg while the two of them stood behind the record player, if we do this, marriage, you should know, I will not always be faithful. I do not expect you to be either, Greg smiled and nodded. All right. I understand, but I will promise to be by your side for the rest of our lives. That will be my promise, that's all I'm asking. It's all I want, she kissed his earlobe. Okay, then I will marry you, she whispered, Greg smiled wide and grabbed her shoulders. He kissed her. I love you, he said, I love you, too, Tareen told him. With all of my heart, just then, someone flung a Waterford crystal vase into the sliding doors of the kitchen, where it shattered everywhere, okay, Tareen said. That is enough, there must have been a million tiny pieces of crystal all over the floor. Clearly, it was time for Nina to shut down this party. Tareen looked around for Nina, but she couldn't find her. Then, she checked for any of Nina's siblings and found none of them either. 
and Brandon was gone, too, there was no one in charge, Vanessa came up to Tareen. Are you looking for the Rivas? she asked, I can't find a single one of them, neither can I. I've been looking for Kit for a half hour. Can't find anybody. But I don't think Nina will be happy, Tareen frowned. It would have to be her that put a stop to this, Greg, Tareen said. Turn off the music, please, Greg nodded and cut the sound. People groaned but no one headed for the door. They didn't really need the music anymore, there were models crying in the corners and rock stars smoking weed on the stairs. There were writers fighting in the dining room and pop stars having sex in the bathrooms and studio execs passed out on the sofas. There were surfers puking on the lawn. Actors throwing wine glasses like footballs. TV stars putting on Nina's clothes and pocketing her jewelry. One of the kids from Family Ties was lying in the middle of the fallen chandelier singing, Heart of Glass, and staring up at the hole left in the ceiling, let's get rid of the caterers, Vanessa said. Maybe stop the flow of booze at least, Tareen nodded and the two of them proceeded to tap every single bartender and cocktail waitress on the shoulder and send them home, but as the last one was out the door, Vanessa and Tareen turned back to the party and saw no discernible difference. It was still loud, things were still getting ruined, the party is over, Tareen yelled, cupping her hands to her mouth to project her voice, no one moved but Kyle Mannheim. He ran out the front door, sheepishly waving goodbye to Vanessa as he did so. She winked at him as he scurried by. The rest of them barely even looked up, do you all care about anything other than yourselves? Vanessa asked, Tareen shook her head. Of course, they do not, she said. You people are revolting, Greg came up behind her and grabbed her hand. Maybe we should go, honey, he said. This isn't your problem, just then, a bullet came through the living room door and hit the mirror above the fireplace, Vanessa and Tareen ducked. Greg followed suit, putting his arms over the both of them. Then the three of them stood back up to see Bridger Miller with a rifle in one hand and his other hand up in the air, as if showing he meant no harm. I found it in a trunk upstairs. I thought it would shoot BBs. He said, laughing. I didn't realize it was a real gun, I swear, everyone out, now. Tareen yelled. Or I'm calling the cops. Two girls got scared and ran out the door. Seth Whittles came running in after hearing the gunshot and grabbed the gun out of Bridger's hand, what the fuck are you doing, man? Seth yelled at him. You could have killed someone, I wasn't going to kill anyone. Bridger, said. But then he walked away, no longer interested, yeah, Seth said, turning to Tareen and Vanessa. Call the cops, Vanessa walked right into the kitchen, picked up the receiver, and dialed the police, yes, officer, she said, suddenly at a loss. We need you to, come here, well, we need someone to, there's a party, you know? And it's. She could not seem to figure out what to say that wouldn't get Nina in trouble. Can you just come? Tareen grabbed the phone out of Vanessa's hand. Please send multiple police units to 28150 Cliffside Drive. There is a party here of over 200 people and it has gotten out of control. Casey had been making her way down the rickety stairs when she noticed everyone looking at her. She lost her focus and took a wrong step, tumbling the last few feet. Mick instinctively caught her, and, because he caught her, Casey thought for a moment that Mick must be her father. But by the time Casey straightened herself out, she remembered that life doesn't work that way, you okay? He asked her, yeah, she said, nodding. She stood up, but couldn't put weight on her ankle. Thanks, Casey, are you alright? Nina asked. Running to her, who the fuck is Casey? Kit mouthed to Jay. Jay shook his head, no idea. But both of them felt a twist in their chests, watching their sister take such special care of someone they had never met before in their lives, Hud wasn't paying attention. He was calculating how long he could bear it before he had to get to the hospital. His nose needed to be reset. He could just tell. 
he tried to pinch the very top of the bridge of it, wondering if that would stop the throbbing. It didn't. So he let go and looked up to see Casey hobbling toward him, he was unclear on exactly who she was. But by the time Nina got Casey safely seated next to her on the surfboard, Hud had figured it out, maybe he was intuitive or maybe he saw Casey's lips. Or maybe the reason Hud made the leap was because he, of all people, knew there had to be more children like him, mix kids who weren't from June, sorry, everyone, Casey said. She was overwhelmed, somewhat from the shock of the fall but mostly from trying to take in the faces of the people she had been anticipating meeting all night. Jay was skinnier, Hud was, much more beat up. And yet, Kit seemed to match perfectly with the picture Casey had had in her mind. She always assumed there would be at least one Riva who looked at her with suspicion. And here she was, what, exactly, is going on? Kit asked, Mick, too, was confused, this is Casey Greens, Nina said, Casey waved and half smiled, not looking directly at any of them, Nina lacked the energy to ease them all into it. She had spent so much of her young life being tactful and gentle and making things okay. But Nina couldn't fix everything, could she? For fuck's sake. She's probably our sister, everyone was surprised, but it was Jay who spoke up. What the hell are you talking about, Mick ignored Jay's incredulity. Casey? Mick said to the girl, Casey nodded, care to fill me in here, hon, Casey began searching for the words. But Nina jumped in and Casey felt taken care of, like she was being wrapped up in a soft blanket, she was adopted in 1965, Nina said. She was raised by the Greens family in Rancho Cucamonga, Nina nudged Casey and put her hand out. Casey handed her the photograph of her mother, this is her mom, Nina said. I mean, her birth mother. You can see on the back, someone wrote a note that you are her father, hearing the phrase birth mother gave Hud the very strong instinct to stand up and sit next to Casey. He had so many things he wanted to ask her, Nina offered Mick the photo and Mick took it from her hands gently, as if he was reluctant to touch it. He looked at it, front and back her name was. Nina realized she had forgotten. What was her name, Casey found her voice. Monica Ridgemore, she said, and it really sank in that she was talking to Mick Riva. One of the most famous men in the world. A man she'd seen on billboards and on TV her entire life. She would have been 18. Apparently, she told people that she was carrying Mick Riva's baby. Your baby, Hud wondered just how many other children his father had fathered. Jay wondered whether the girl was lying. And Kit wondered how they all could possibly be descended from the man in front of them. They were nothing like him, I don't want anything from you, Casey said. Any of you? Well, not money or anything like that. I have enough money, she had so much less than any one of the Riva kids had at that very moment. She had such a small fraction of what Mick had that you couldn't calculate it in whole percentages, I'm here, because. Casey found it difficult to keep going. She knew the words she wanted to say, she just didn't know if she could withstand the ache of saying them. I don't have anyone else. Mick looked up from studying the photo and saw that Casey had her mother's eyes, she's looking for family, Nina said. Sound familiar, Mick gave a shy and bittersweet smile, his eyes downcast. He looked at Nina and then Casey. And then back down at the photo, he tried to place the face in the picture. Had he slept with this woman, Monica Ridgemore, in 1964 or 65? Those were big years for him. He'd toured all over the world. He'd slept with a lot of women. Some of them were groupies. And, yes, some of them had been young, Mick looked up from the photo and at Casey, at her eyes and her cheekbones and her lips. There was something familiar about her, but that was a feeling Mick had all the time. He had met so many people in his lifetime that, years ago, it had begun to feel like there were no strangers anymore. Just different versions of the same person over and over, 
it was just as likely that Mick had slept with Monica and forgotten about it as it was that Monica had made it up, I don't know, he said, finally. He watched Casey's eyes, close and her chest fall as she understood she would find no answer tonight. I'm sorry, Casey. I know that's probably not what you wanted to hear. But the truth is that I just don't know, it broke them all a tiny little bit, Nina, Jay, Hud, Kit, and Casey. There was no end to the ways he could disappoint, six police officers arrived in three squad cars, they drove through the quiet streets of Point du May. Their sirens off, their lights silently cascading over the high fences and hedges, when they got to Nina's door, they knocked. If they'd been at an out-of-control party in Compton, they would not have knocked. Limert Park, Inglewood, Downtown, Koreatown, East LA, Van Nuys, they would have walked right in. But this was Malibu, where the rich white people live. And rich white people get the benefit of the doubt and all of its many benefits, the door opened just as Sergeant Eddie Purdy's knuckles grazed it. Sergeant Purdy was stocky and stout with a face covered in stubble unless he shaved twice a day. He gazed up to see the gorgeous woman in front of him, oh, thank God you are here, Tareen said. You need to do something. Now they are on the roof, trying to ride surfboards like sleds into the pool, there was broken glass and vomit and passed out half-naked bodies and two people doing lines off a silver platter. The female Channel 4 News anchor was crying into a bowl of dip, Ma'am, is this your home? Sergeant Purdy asked, No, it is not. Is the owner of the home here, we are still looking for her, Tareen said. Vanessa was outside, on the hunt, well, can you help us to find out where she might be, he said. I need to speak with whoever is the owner first, Tareen stood up, trying to explain herself more clearly. I just told you, I do not know where Nina is, but I think the more urgent issue is to get things under control, could she be upstairs? Sergeant Purdy asked. He directed some of the men to look around the party, sir, there's an asshole around here shooting up mirrors, Tareen said. Can we focus on that, ma'am, please watch your language, are you even listening? Tareen asked. I do not know who has the gun now. Bridger Miller shot out the sliding glass doors. So please do something, ma'am, Sergeant Purdy said. I'm going to need you to calm down. Now, where did you last see the owner of the house, sir, I have told you already. I do not know where Nina is. She is probably with her father. Mick Riva showed up here a little while ago, Mick Riva owns this home? Sergeant Purdy looked back to his men and raised his eyebrows, as if to say this was an important detail he'd uncovered. Ma'am, that would have been good to mention earlier, he does not own the home. His daughter owns the home, Sergeant Purdy's voice was growing more impatient. Tell us where Mr. Riva is, why? Tareen asked. Do you want an autograph? Vanessa came around the corner. I was thinking maybe they are, she spotted the cops. Oh, good. You can help us. Someone peed on a Lichtenstein. A Lichtenstein, I understand, ma'am, Sergeant Purdy said, though by the way he said it, it was clear to everyone, including his men, that he did not know what a Lichtenstein was, there was a crash from upstairs and then a loud splash. It sounded like someone had thrown or ridden a surfboard off the roof, are you going to do something now, or what, officer? Tareen asked. Ma'am, adjust your tone. I could have you arrested for speaking to me like that, oh, I do not think so, Tareen said, Purdy's men now started chattering around him, laughing without looking him in eye. Vanessa understood things were about to take a turn, ma'am, I admit you're awfully pretty. And I'm sure you're in charge, wherever you go. I bet it's a sight to watch. But you're not in charge here, all right? He smiled at Tareen, and what grated at her most was that it was such a genuine smile. So you will speak to me with respect, hun, or we are going to have a very big problem, officer, if you could just, Vanessa started but Tareen interrupted her, maybe if you actually did your job, instead of standing around like this. She said, I would not need to speak to you at all, 
I'm not messing around anymore. You're making me angry, Purdy said as he moved toward her. So you better watch that mouth, Tareen could feel the space between them narrowing, she could feel Purdy's eyes on her. Excuse me, she said. I was the one who called you here. I have done nothing wrong, she leaned away from him as she spoke, trying to maintain her personal space, Purdy moved in closer. You sure are a ball buster, aren't you? And then he took his left hand and brought it up to her face and looked her in the eye as he smoothed her hair behind her ear. There. That's better, Tareen pulled her hand back and slapped Sergeant Eddie Purdy across the face. Jay looked at his father and felt the anger begin to pour out of him. Do you even know how many children you have? He snapped. There were so many thoughts rushing through his head, so many appalling scenarios he was only now considering. Specifically, it was the first time in Jay's life that it had occurred to him that there might be more than just the four of them. He felt smaller and smaller by the second, let's not get into all of this, Mick said, shaking his head, his children just continued to stare at him. I have had three paternity suits brought against me, Mick said, finally. And all of them turned out not to be me, that's your answer? Kit asked, Mick lowered his eyes and then looked at Kit. Kit shook her head. You're a real prize, Pops, there was something about the mocking way Kit referred to him that took Mick's breath away, why weren't these kids even a little happy to see him? He had never treated his parents this way. No matter what his mother did, no matter where his father went, he was always glad when they came back, two women I was with terminated their pregnancies, that I know of, Mick said, charming, Kit said sharply, Mick tried to ignore her. Another woman had a miscarriage. But I was generally very careful. Especially after I left your mother the last time. I was very, very careful, do you want a prize or something? Kit asked, will you listen to me? I'm trying to answer your question. I'm trying to explain something to you. I tried my best to be responsible about it. I always told women I slept with that I didn't want any children. I said, if I had any interest in being a dad, I'd go home to my kids. The beach went deadly silent, wow, Kit finally said, her fury raging inside her with such a fervor that her cheeks were turning red. You know what, she continued. That's fine. Thanks for clearing it up. Because I always did kind of wonder if you loved us, and now we know, Mick shook his head, but she kept talking. It's fine. We had each other. We barely noticed you were gone, Mick could see the pain in his stoic daughter's face, the way her chin quivered, the way her eyes narrowed. He had worn the same face himself as a child, wondering the same thing, coming to the same conclusion, Mick shook his head again. You're misunderstanding me, I'm not really sure how that's possible, Dad, Hud said. You seem clear that you never wanted to be our father until now. It had nothing to do with want. Mick said, his voice beginning to rise. That's what I'm trying to tell you. I'm trying to tell you that if I could have been a dad, would have been your dad. I wanted to be a father to you all. But I couldn't. I couldn't be a father, this is something you have to understand about being a parent, some people just aren't cut out for it. Some people don't have what it takes. And I didn't. But I'm here now. And I'm hoping that we can make something of all this. I just, I simply couldn't before. But now, I think I have what it takes. And I want to be a part of your lives now. I want to, get dinners and, I don't know, spend holidays together or whatever it is that families do. I want that, suddenly, Nina started cackling. Laughing like a madwoman, like the women they used to burn at the stake. My God, Nina said, putting her hands in her hair, shaking her head. I almost fell for it. I forgot your words mean nothing. That you just say whatever you want, but you're never prepared to do anything meaningful, at all, Nina. Mick said. Please don't say that. I'm trying to explain to you why I wasn't capable of being a father until now, Nina shook her head. If you were any kind of real parent, 
you would know that capable has nothing to do with it, Mick frowned at her and sighed, do you think mom felt capable of raising four children on her own? Holding her head up high when the whole world knew you'd left her. Twice. Making all of the money, and doing all of the housework, and helping each of us with our homework? Making every single one of our birthdays special despite having no money and no time? Remembering that Jay likes chocolate cake with buttercream and Kit likes coconut cake and Hud likes yellow cake with chocolate frosting? Always having the perfect number of candles? Do you think I felt capable of taking it all over after she fucking drowned? Do you think I felt capable of trying to pay all the bills and still scraping up enough money for coconut at the fucking Malibu Mart? Do you think I felt capable of holding each one of these guys as they woke up in the middle of the night remembering that they had essentially been orphaned? Do you think I wanted to drop out of high school so I could do it all? That I wanted to be 25 years old without a high school diploma, Mick flinched as he heard this, and when Nina saw the pinched look on his face, it pissed her off, I didn't feel capable of any of that. But did that matter? Of course not. So I've gotten up every single day since mom died, and even a lot of the days before that, and I have done what needed to be done. Capable is a question I never had the luxury of asking. Because my family needed me. And unlike you, I understand how important that is, Nina, Mick tried to interject, you think I want to be here selling photos of my ass and living on this fucking cliff? No, I don't. I want to be in Portugal somewhere living in a shack on the beach, riding waves and eating the catch of the day. But I don't. I stay here. That's what it means to be a family. Staying. Not just strolling into a party after midnight expecting a hug, Nina, you're right. I'm a weak, must be nice. To be able to be weak. I wouldn't know, at this. Kit smiled to herself and quickly rested her chin on her hand in order to hide it, Nina continued. You have no idea what it takes to stand by anyone. You certainly don't know what it takes to stand by a child. Mom did that. And when mom couldn't, I tried to finish the job. No, scratch that. I didn't try to finish the job. I did finish the job. Because look at them. They are all talented and smart and good, and, sure, we're not perfect. But we have integrity. We know something about loyalty. We are there for each other. And all of that is because mom and I did a great job. You, you have done nothing despite how capable you probably could have been if you gave half a shit. But because you weren't here, we learned how to go on without you, Nina took a moment and closed her eyes. And then, she looked back up at her father. It's not my place to speak for the rest of us, Dad, so I'll just say this for me, there's no room for you in my life anymore. And I don't owe it to you to make any space. When Nina stopped speaking, she dried the tears off her cheeks with her hands and then wiped her hands on her sweatpants. She caught her breath and settled her chest. As she stood there, she felt a peace take over, as if by speaking her anger. She had freed it from where it had been living in her body. It was as if her tendons were loosening, leaving behind a new softness within her in places that had long ago hardened, Mick watched his daughter's face begin to calm. And he wanted so badly to move to her and hold her, to hug her, like he had when she was six years old, when they were just a few miles down this very beach running with that kite. But he knew better than to make a single step toward her, do you all feel this way? Mick asked the rest of his children, Nina looked away from her father, toward the ocean, and wiped her eyes again, Kit looked at the sand as she nodded. Hud, bruised inside and out, looked at his father. I think it's just. It's too late, Dad, Jay said, it hurt Jay to say it. He felt bad for his father. He felt bad for his siblings. But more than anything, it made Jay so sad to be offered a father now when he had needed one so badly before. The man in front of him had never been the man he'd yearned for. The man he'd yearned for had never existed. And that was a pain unto itself, Mick pursed his lips and nodded, absorbing it all. 
he looked at his children. His firstborn, who had raised her siblings and gone on to make a career for herself. His older son, who was now renowned in a field beyond Mick's own grasp. His third-born, who had found a way to succeed in this world despite his rocky beginning. His fourth-born, who appeared to have inherited the things he liked about himself the most without any contact with him at all. And even this young girl, the one who may or may not be his, who appeared to have faced so much of what he, himself, had faced at her age, but with so much more grace than he ever had, okay, Mick said. I get it, he needed his children now that he was alone. Now that he was afraid he wasn't going to matter very soon. Now that he had a house that echoed, but they didn't need him, I never meant for you to grow up feeling alone. Feeling, like you had no one to rely on, he said, momentarily covering his eyes with the pads of his fingers. I can't imagine you'd believe me, but I swear that was the very last thing I wanted, at this, Mick's voice started to crack. My dad stepped out on my mom a lot, he said. He left for long stretches of time. And my mom, she would forget about me for days. They both would, Nina looked away from her father and watched a family of dolphins swim past them all, diving in and out of the water in tandem. She loved how they always moved in a pack, in one direction. They never cared what was happening on the shore, they just kept going. Dolphins had been swimming along the shore in Malibu well before she was born and they would be swimming along the shore here in Malibu well after she left. And she took comfort in that, then they both died when I was your age, Casey, Mick said. At the same time. Just like, just like you. Just like you all, really. My mother, she got mad at my father one afternoon shortly after he took up with a waitress at the deli. She set the linens on fire. I wasn't there. So I don't know exactly what happened. But I've always thought it was probably just to upset my old man. But then, then it grew out of control too quickly. I was 18. I came home from school and our apartment was gone, burned to the stilts. They were both dead, Mick looked up at the sky, then back at his children. In an instant, I was on my own. I didn't graduate high school either, he said, looking at Nina, Nina looked her father in the eye and her face tightened. She felt for him. But it made her even more angry, that he had allowed her to lose what he himself had lost. He had, all along, known the cost of it and had done nothing to stop it from happening to her, too, I don't think I ever really knew how it felt to be loved until I met your mother. I was born to people who never cared, people who couldn't even be bothered to not set the house on fire. Anyway, I'm whining about it like I've got some sob story. That's not my point. My point is that, I know how it feels to wonder. If anyone loves you, if you matter at all. And I should never have done that to you. I set out to make sure you never felt that way, he said, a lump forming in his throat. But, I don't know, somehow it still happened, when I found out your mother died, I just wanted it to go away. I didn't want to believe it. I wanted to still imagine her with you. I did not want to face that I had failed you and that the world had taken the only good parent you had. So I just, ignored it. I pretended it wasn't true. And then I got the notice that you'd filed for guardianship, and I, I felt like the decision had been made for me. You never even acknowledged it, Nina said, every day I didn't call just made it that much more shameful I hadn't called. But, that was about me. Not about you. And what I'm getting at here is that I used to think the way my parents treated me was because I wasn't worth loving or I wasn't, good enough. But. Mick closed his eyes and shook his head. What I did, the way I failed you, I guess, it wasn't because you didn't deserve to be taken care of. It was because of me. My parents weren't ever able to tell me that, and so I've never been sure. But I'm here right now and I can make sure you know, you deserved better. You deserved the world, Mick's eyes welled up and he looked each of them in the eye, even Casey. Every minute of your lives you were loved, he said as his chin started to quake. 
He put his hands together in a prayer motion and put them to his chest and said, If I exist on this earth, someone loves you. I'm just, I'm a very selfish man but I promise you all, I love you. I love you so much, the sky was just beginning to lighten. Nina was so tired, I think the problem, dad, she said, with an unexpected warmth in her voice, is that your love doesn't mean very much. Mick closed his eyes. And he nodded. And he said, I know, honey. I know. And I'm sorry, Sergeant Purdy put handcuffs on Tareen as she screamed at him, are you kidding me, she shouted, you accosted a police officer, he said, and then he pulled her hands behind her back. The movement turned her elbows out and threw her off balance. Tareen tripped on the step in front of her and fell down. He unceremoniously pulled her up, and as he did, he dragged her body toward him, tight against his torso. He smiled, Vanessa snapped. Without thinking, she pushed him. Don't touch her again, she said, the cop behind Purdy grabbed Vanessa by both of her arms and cuffed her, pulling her arms tight behind her. Greg came back around the corner at the same time Ricky came into the living room. Wondering what all of the commotion was about, what the hell is going on? Greg yelled. Let her go, instinctually, Ricky lunged forward and pushed both cops off the women. Purdy fell back, the other cop barely moved. You get off of them. Ricky said. I don't care what badge you're wearing, Purdy looked at Ricky and Ricky instantly understood this was going to cost him. But he stood tall as both cops moved toward him, and remained stoic as they pulled his arms behind his back and cuffed him, he winced at the tightness of the restraints themselves, but as he did, Tareen caught his eye and mouthed thank you. Vanessa smiled at him. Greg gave Ricky a nod, and the remaining crowd cheered, Tareen, Vanessa, and Ricky were all going to jail. But at least they'd put up a fight, then the police raided the house, they got the two actors hallucinating from LSD on the tennis courts, Tuesday Hendricks and Rafael Lopez, possession, the one supplying coke, Bobby Houseman, possession with intent to distribute, the two throwing serving trays like oversized ninja stars, Vaughn Donovan and Bridger Miller. Vandalism, the naked woman blowing a drummer in the middle of the lawn, Wendy Palmer, indecent exposure, lewd conduct, the ones with pockets full of what were clearly Nina's and Brandon's belongings, Ted Travis and Vicky Brooks, Grand Larceny, and the one holding a gun, Seth Whittles, possession of a loaded firearm without a license, dot, there were so many of them that the cops had to call in a police van. They loaded each of them in as they cleared out the rest of the house. Bridger stared daggers at Tuesday the second he saw her. Tuesday refused to look at him, focused entirely on Raphael. Ted and Vicky tried to hold hands in handcuffs. Bobby nodded at Wendy. Wendy smiled kindly at Seth. Vaughn was trying not to vomit. Ricky was seated next to Vanessa, pushed together tight, almost no room between them, weird night, he said to her, yeah, she said. Weird night. But thank you, for, you know, standing up to that cop for me. Oh, yeah, Ricky said. Sure. I mean, anytime, Vanessa smiled and leaned over and kissed Ricky on the lips. Maybe we could hang out sometime, she said, Ricky nodded. How about tomorrow night, assuming we're not both in jail, excellent, Vanessa said, the two of them sat there, handcuffed next to each other, smiles creeping across their faces. And in this way, the very end of the night contained its own kind of beginnings, Tareen was the last one escorted to the van, I'm going to come get you, Greg called to her. I'll be right behind the van, please, she yelled, as the doors were shut. These people are crazy, on the way to the precinct, the cops came across a crashed black jaguar on the side of the road. The hood was crunched around a tree, the engine smoking, they arrested the very drunk but completely unscathed Brandon Randall, driving while intoxicated, dot, 13 arrests, hundreds of people kicked out of the house, and the Rivas nowhere to be found, by the time the clock struck 5 a.m., the party of the decade was over. 5 a.m., the six of them sat on the beach in silence for a while, no one quite ready to move, 
they had the answers to the questions Nina, Jay, Hud, Kit, and even Mick had held in the backs of their minds for the past two decades. Would he ever come back? Could he belong to them once more, yes. But no, and so they all sat quietly as the world shifted and settled within each of them, after what felt like hours, Nina stood up and wiped the sand off her legs. The Santa Ana winds were gearing up, she could feel it against her shoulders. It's getting cold, she said, the six of them put the surfboards back in the shed and started climbing back up the cliff, Jay was reeling from almost everything that had happened over the past twelve hours. He was having trouble processing what had taken place, and he knew it would be some time until he truly understood it all. But there was one thing that felt clear to him now, he did not want to be anything like his father, there had been so many times over the past years that Jay had hoped his father's glory or prestige might have rubbed off on him. But now he could see plainly, he did not want to indulge that about himself the way his father had, in fact, despite everything, he had to admit if there was a man in his life to look up to, it had always been Hud. As difficult as that felt to swallow at that given moment, it was still undeniably true, as Hud struggled up the stairs, Jay came up behind. He put his arm out to help and said. In a voice that was not a whisper, but was not heard by anyone else, I need you to be sorry, I am, Hud told him, no, you have to be so sorry that I know you'll never lie to me again so that I know I can still trust you forever. Like nothing has changed, Hud looked at his brother and allowed his sorrow to surface. Jay could see the pain in his brother's face and body, and he knew Hud well enough to know that it wasn't the broken ribs. I am that sorry, Hud said. Okay, Jay said. We're okay. And with that, Jay took the full weight of his brother's body onto his shoulder and helped Hud up the cliff, all this talk of their father made Hud think of their mother. And he thought of the story she used to tell him, how he had been handed to her, and she had held him as he cried, and loved him right then and there, she had chosen to love him and it had changed his life, Hud would love his child the way his mother had loved him, actively, every day, and without ambiguity, and maybe twenty-five years from now, all of them plus a whole new generation of Rivas would be right here on this very beach and maybe there would be another reckoning. Perhaps his children would tell him he'd been too permissive or he'd been too strict. He'd put too much emphasis on X when it should have been Y, he smiled to think of it, the ways in which he would mess this whole thing up. It was inevitable, wasn't it? The small mistakes and heartbreaks of guiding a life? His mother had screwed up almost as much as she'd succeeded, but the one thing he knew in his bones was that he would not leave his child, his children, if he was lucky, would know, from the day they were born, that he was not going anywhere, Kit, despite herself, did feel something for her father. She did not like him, Percy. But she was happy to have learned that he had a soul, however imperfect. Somehow, knowing her father wasn't all bad made her like herself more, made her less afraid of who she might be down in the unmined depths of her heart. As they made their way up the stairs, Kit pushed ahead of everyone as only little sisters can and then stopped when she got to Casey, she slowed down, and as she passed her she said, excuse me, later on, Kit would look back on that moment, that time they were all walking, mostly in silence, back up the stairs with their father, as the moment their family rearranged, made room for Casey to stay, made room for Nina to go. Kit tapped Nina on the shoulder. Hey, she whispered, hi, Nina said what's the place in Portugal? Kit asked, huh? Nina said, the place in Portugal. Where you said you wanted to go and eat the catch of the day, oh, Nina said. I don't know. I was just talking, no, you weren't. Kit said. I know you, it doesn't matter, it was the most honest you've ever been, Kit said. It matters more than anything, Nina turned, and looked at her sister. It's Madeira. I've always wanted to live in Madeira in a tiny house on the water, the kind of place where you only go into town once a week to buy food. I'd love to be somewhere where no one knows who I am or who my dad is and no one has my posters on their wall and I can eat anything I want to. And I can cut all my hair off if I feel like it and maybe be a gardener or a landscaper. Something outside. 
where no one knows I was married to Brandon. And when the waves are good, I'm always in the water, Kit saw it in perfect technicolor. The thing they could all do for Nina. Mick knew that if he really loved his kids, he would leave them alone. That seemed easy, that seemed doable. He thought of it as his own redemption, and so, as he made his way up the steps, he decided he'd hug each of them, give them his direct phone number, tell them he would be there if they wanted to go get lunch, and then get in his jag and drive away, he turned to Casey, just as his feet hit the grass, and he said, I'll take a paternity test. If you want. Just let me know, Casey, still finding this night beyond belief and sad and a tiny bit thrilling, smiled at him. Then, just in case he was her father, she grabbed his hand and squeezed it, as the family came up to the lawn, the remaining cops shined their lights on the faces of Mick and his five children. And it was then that, for one of the first times in their lives, they saw why it's good to have Mick Riva as your father, they all went inside and, after ten minutes of smiles and handshakes and autographs and polite laughing at inane stories, the cops resolved to be on their way, we had some arrests, Sergeant Purdy said. Nobody you'd miss, I can't imagine. Vandals, really, Nina wasn't sure what to say to that and she wondered who the cops had arrested. Thank you, officers, she said. She showed them to the front door, then she turned and looked at her family. Her brothers had blood crusted on their faces, her sister had a hickey, what, and there were two more bodies than there'd been at the beginning of this whole thing. All right, Mick said. I believe this is my cue to leave, he entertained the fantasy that someone might try to stop him. He wasn't too surprised when no one did, he hugged his sons first, and then his possible daughter, and then the one with the big mouth, and then as he got to the front door, the one who had saved the family he had started, thank you, Mick whispered in her ear as he pulled Nina to him. For the person you've been your entire life. And all that you've done, and then, before Nina could even realize she was crying, he was gone, Nina sat down on the steps facing the door and her brothers and sister sat down next to her, you okay? Hud asked, Nina looked up at him, so many feelings dancing around inside her, out of the grasp of words. I mean. She said and then gave up, right, he said, me, too, Kit added, yeah, Jay said, Casey stood by the door, Hud looked at her there, alone and unsure, on the threshold. Come on, sit down. I don't care who your dad is. You're one of us, Kit scooted over to make room. And when Casey sat down next to Nina, Jay squeezed her shoulder. Nina patted her knee, she needed someone to love her. And they could do that. That would be very easy for them to do, June was gone. Yet here she was, living on through her children. 6 AM it took exactly 52 minutes for them to convince Nina to leave. The five of them were all standing around the island in the kitchen, eating from the cracker tray, Kit pitched the initial idea. What if you just left and went to Portugal right now, Hud was silent. Casey wasn't sure what to say. And Nina dismissed it over and over again, until Jay started echoing Kit, it's not actually that crazy, Nina, he said. You don't want to live here. Especially now. You don't want to be with Brandon. You don't want all the attention. You don't want any of this and you also don't want to have to explain yourself to everyone. So leave. Don't tell anybody. Just go, you're saying I leave my things. My bank account, my house. And no one will have any idea where I am. Nina said, I mean. That's not exactly what we are saying, Hud said, Brandon will know where I am, won't he? So he'll still be a problem. People still know who dad is. Everyone is going to know I got cheated on. Everyone's gonna know my husband left me for Carrie fucking Soto, can I just say? Casey stepped in. That she seems like, as my mother used to say when she was really mad, a real asshole, yes, you can, Nina said. Yes, you can say that, Kit saw then that there was a version of Nina, the nice girl who always said the nice thing, who was gone. 
and there was a slightly new Nina, who agreed when someone said the woman that fucked her husband was an asshole. And Kit thought, for both the old Nina and this new Nina, she wanted Portugal, will you just listen to me? Kit said. It's actually pretty simple, okay, Nina said, exasperated. Go ahead, we don't want people tracking you down. We want them to leave you alone. So we make it really ambiguous. You leave now. The party got out of control. I'm sure it will be in the papers. And people will think you ran off with someone or something, or that I died, I mean, maybe, Hud said, conceding the unlikely possibility. So, fine, Kit said. People say you died. Who cares? That just means they will leave you alone. We know you're not dead. We'll tell Mick you're not dead. I can tell Tareen or whoever you want. We'll tell anyone that will keep the secret. But then you take some cash, you drive to the airport, and you get a one-way ticket to Portugal. Get yourself a small house. Or whatever. See if you like it. If you don't, then you'll come home. And if you do, then stay as long as you want. And we will come visit you. All the time. And no one would even question it because the surfing is great there. Hud and Jay would probably go all the time anyway for surf shoots and shit. I'll tag along. We will see you all the time. We will come stay with you for weeks sometimes. We'll always be in your hair, I can't leave, Nina said. I can't leave you all. You. Need me, no, Kit said. Not anymore. We love you, and we want you around. But, Nina, you don't need to take care of us anymore, she's right, Hud said. Kit's right, and that is when Nina started to wonder if this wasn't such a crazy idea. She started to wonder if she could just go. It felt daring to even imagine, Kit's right. You should go, Nina, Jay said. It's totally not like you to do it. And that's exactly why you have to, Nina was listening to him. He could tell, you've spent your whole life making up for mom and dad. We don't talk about it very much, but, mom didn't make it easy either. But I have always known that it didn't matter how drunk mom got or whether dad came home because you would always be there. I've known that, too, Hud said, I've known it my entire life, Kit said. I know it now. And I'll know it even if you live on a beach in Madeira, Casey stepped in. I barely know you and you've made me feel that way. It seems like it's just the way you are. Kit looked at Casey and could see that Casey cared about her family, cared about Nina already. Kit wondered what it would be like to be someone's older sister, to pass along the stuff you've figured out. She could do that. She wanted to do that. What if they find my car at the airport at some point and track me down? Nina asked, Kit started smiling. They'd moved on to logistics, my truck, Casey said. It's parked down the road, way past the bluffs. I was, I was intimidated by the valets. And, all the fancy cars. Casey walked over to her purse and pulled out her keys. It's a red pickup with three quarters of a tank of gas. Registered in my dad's name. Should get you to whatever airport you want to leave from. And then, you know, go. Fly to Portugal and do something for you. For once. Just for a little while, Kit said, it was the little while that got her. She could go for a little while. There would be no harm in a little while, what about the restaurant? Nina asked. Who is going to make sure everything runs, we'll sell the restaurant, Kit said. I'm sorry, but we need to sell it and take the money. Mom hated that place. She never wanted it for us. Let Ramon take it over, he actually cares about it. We should let it go. We don't have to live life the exact same way Mom did or Grandma did. It's ours to do with what we want and I say you go to Portugal and let us sell the damn thing, please, Nina looked at Hud. Hud looked at Jay. Yeah, Jay said. Kit's right. 
Mom wouldn't want you to stay here so you could run the restaurant. Mom would have hated that. That was true, wasn't it? And yet here Nina was, holding on to it simply because her mother had carried it before her, Nina suddenly had a picture in her head. It was as if June had given her a box, as if every parent gives their children a box, full of the things they carried, June had given her children this box packed to the brim with her own experiences, her own treasures and heartbreaks. Her own guilts and pleasures, triumphs and losses, values and biases, duties and sorrows, and Nina had been carrying around this box her whole life, feeling the full weight of it, but it was not, Nina saw just then, her job to carry the full box. Her job was to sort through the box. To decide what to keep, and to put the rest down. She had to choose what, of the things she inherited from the people who came before her, she wanted to bring forward. And what, of the past, she wanted to leave behind, and so, she put down the restaurant. Just as her mother would have wanted her to. And when she let it go, she let it go for June, too, yeah, Nina said. You're right. We don't need to keep the restaurant, and as quickly as she understood all of this, she also understood that eventually, she would have to open the box her father had given her, too, the one she had all but thrown away, one day, when the world made a bit more sense to her, she would have to go through that box and try to see if there was anything inside worth saving. Maybe there wasn't much. But maybe there was more than she thought, Hud smiled at Nina. Go, Nina, seriously. Go was there even a good excuse to say no? Nina was having a hard time thinking of a single reason to stay except the people standing in front of her, I can be the Nina now, Jay said. Let me know that no matter where you are, no matter what happens, you and these guys will always be safe because of me, and me, Hud said, and me, Kit said. And Casey, she added as she put her arm around Casey's shoulders. And so, Nina, breathless and stunned at the joy daring to bloom within her, pulled her siblings to her, and decided to go. Just for a little while. 7 a.m., Mick Riva couldn't find his Jaguar. There were still a few cars left in the side yard but none of them were his, and none of them had keys. And he didn't want to bother his kids, so, as he stood at the entrance to his daughter's driveway, where the gravel met the road, he smoked his last cigarette, and then decided to walk to PCH, where he would hitch a ride, Mick Riva, hitching a ride. What a riot. He'd make someone's day, he took the final drag of the cigarette, blew out the smoke, and threw the butt in the air. It cascaded over the gravel drive and landed, softly, in the bushes, the dry, arid desert bushes of Malibu. On a morning plagued by Santa Ana winds. In a land of scrub brush. In a town under constant threat of combustion. In an area of the country where a tiny spark could destroy acres. In a region that yearns to burn, and so, with the very best of intentions, Mick Riva walked away, having no idea he had just set fire to 28150 Cliffside Drive, before the smoke had become visible, Hud and Jay hugged Nina and told her they loved her and would see her soon. And then Jay drove Hud to the hospital, as they sat in the waiting room, Jay told Hud the very thing he had been afraid to tell anyone, I have cardiomyopathy, he said and then explained what it meant, that he would have to stop surfing, but you're going to be okay? Hud asked. His eyes were starting to water and Jay couldn't quite stand to see his brother cry at that moment. Yeah, Jay said, nodding. I'll be okay. I'm just gonna find something else to do with my life, I guess, Hud shook his head. I mean, no worries there. You're good at almost everything you do, Jay smiled and breathed in deeply. But, I. He said, having a hard time finding the words. I've just been, worried. About letting you down, me, we're a team, Hud smiled and then came clean himself. I actually think pretty soon I won't be able to travel as much, what do you mean? I, I don't know the best way to tell you this. And I swear, I just learned it tonight but, Jay knew. He knew it a half second before Hud said it, Ashley's pregnant, 
Jay closed his eyes and laughed. You've got to be kidding me, he said, Hud shook his head. I'm dead serious, Jay nodded. Wow. Well, you know what they say. If you're gonna sleep with your brother's ex-girlfriend, make sure you knock her up while you're at it, Hud laughed and then grabbed his rib cage and caught his breath. I don't think they say that, no, they don't. Jay stared at his shoes for a moment and then back to his brother, are we still cool? Hud asked, Jay nodded. Look, I still think you're a dick. And I'm probably going to think that for a while. But yeah, we're okay. We'll be fine, they were quiet for a moment, the world still recalibrating between them, so I guess we're both sticking around Malibu for a while then, Hud nodded. Yeah, although. He said. I was actually thinking of photographing Kit. Seeing if I can sell the photos, to surf, Kit? Really, she's good, Jay, he said. She's, outrageously good, Jay nodded slowly, realizing he already knew that. Yeah, okay, he said, thinking of how brash Kit could be in the water, how daring. He was imagining just how great the photos could be, she'd be something new and exciting, like Nina had been but she'd be bold, going for big waves and sharper moves, like him. Maybe she was the best of all of them. Maybe, Jay thought for a second, she's the whole point. She's good and will help her be the best, Jay said. Maybe one day Kit takes the triple crown. Maybe that's our new goal, Hud put out his hand and Jay shook it, and they ushered in the next chapter of the Riva dynasty. Two hours later, after Hud's nose had been reset, Jay drove him to Ashley's house, there, at her front door, Hud Riva got down on one knee and proposed. Jay watched from the car as Ashley said yes, before the smoke had become visible, Casey gave Nina the keys to her truck and hugged her and thanked her for being exactly the kind of person Casey had needed at that very moment, I'm glad I met you, she said, if only for a few hours, Nina smiled. It's certainly been an intense time. Hasn't it? This is a real baptism by fire, Kit hugged Nina and told her she loved her and would see her soon. You have to do this, she said. And Nina understood, maybe for the first time, that letting people love you and care for you is part of how you love and care for them, Case and I are going out to breakfast, Kit said. Please don't be here when we get back, Nina smiled, tears forming in her eyes. Kit started to cry but wiped the tears away. As Kit and Casey headed for the door, Kit's hand hit the knob and she couldn't go just yet. She turned and ran back to her older sister, I'll always love you, she said. No matter who you are or what sort of life you want. One day, she knew, she would tell her sister all that she was just learning about who she was. They both had plenty of time for understanding all the ways they'd both changed tonight. I love you just for being, whoever that is, oh, kiddo, Nina said, the tears now falling from her face. Back at ya, Kit pulled her sister into her arms, squeezed her so tight that it felt like they might fuse together, and then pulled away and left her there, to leave on her own. Before the smoke had become visible, Nina Riva took one last look around the house, at the shattered glass and the ruined paintings, the chandelier on the floor and the broken lamps. She felt unbridled glee at it not being her problem. She relished the thought of not being the one who had to clean it up, not having to live on a cliff, not having to look at Brandon ever again, she grabbed a few things and threw them in a bag. She held Casey's keys in her hand, and walked down the road to the red pickup truck, it hurt to leave, but Nina knew that most good things come with a pinch or an ache, all she had ever needed was her family. Her siblings. And maybe, now that they didn't need her, she could find some peace and quiet. Some sunshine. Some privacy, after all, her family had grown up. And wasn't this the day you always looked toward? When the kids were grown and your life was yours to take, the flames traveled over the gravel and dirt to find the grass and leaves and wood they needed, they started to inhale the house, climbing up its sides, passing over windows in favor of the roof. They took hold of the paintings, the clothes, the broken glass inside. 
They seized the white walls and the ivory couches, the ecru carpets. The wine cellar, the barbecue, the lawn, the tennis court, 28150 Cliffside Drive burned in vivid orange and gray, the smell of carbon wafting out over the sea, by the time the fire had fully claimed the estate and started rolling down the coastline. Greg had gotten Tareen out of jail, Kit and Casey had tracked down Ricky and Vanessa and bailed them out, Seth's mom had picked him up, Caroline had sprung Bobby, Vaughn's and Bridger's agents had freed them and started responding to reporters asking for comment. Ted's business manager had shown up to help him and Vicky, Tuesday's publicist had come to get her and Raphael, and Wendy's brother had taken her home and already hired her a lawyer. By the time the firefighters arrived, Brandon was out on bond and already in the hotel room of Carrie Soto. They turned on the TV to see his home in flames on the morning news, as Point du May was evacuated, Neighbors leaving their homes holding their children and photo albums, their dogs packed in the way backs of their luxury station wagons, the blaze roared into the sky. It began reaching its fingers out for treetops and the second stories of other properties, clutching whole homes in its grasp, the people of Malibu knew how to evacuate. They'd done this before. They would do it again, by the time the fire was contained, the mansion turned to a charred, wet frame, the neighbors' homes singed and covered in ash. The sky stained gray, firefighters wiping their brows, the lady of the house was nowhere to be found, Nina Riva was mid-flight, she would read about the fire later in an American paper and clutch her chest, relieved no one had been hurt. She would think of the damage and the distress it must have caused, but she would understand that it was one fire, in a long line of fires in Malibu since the dawn of time, it had brought destruction it would also bring renewal, rising from the ashes, the story of fire. This is the end of the story. I hope you all have enjoyed listening to this audiobook. Take care and stay safe.